Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's November 24th, 2020, and I could not be more excited to have back with us on Mormon Stories Podcast, Dr. Matt Harris. Um, Matt Harris is a professor of history at Colorado State University, Pueblo. Um, we recently had a Matt or Dr. Harris on Mormon Stories Podcast for an epic series on Ezra Tapp Benson. I highly, highly recommend you all check that out. But today we are going to be featuring yet another book um, that Matt Harris uh, co-edited along with the legendary Neil Newell Bringhurst. Um, the book is called The LDS Gospel Topic Series, A Scholarly Engagement. And it is published by none other than Signature Books, one of the most important publishers in the history of Mormonism, if not the most important important publishing houses in history of Mormonism. Right now, go buy this book. Just one chapter alone, which we're going to be covering next, and the chapter is called uh, Whiteness Theology and the Evolution of Mormon Racial Teachings by Matt Harris himself, is worth the purchase of this book alone. We're covering that uh, chapter uh, along with many other chapters in future Mormon Stories podcast episodes the one with Matt today. But today we're going to be talking about sort of a history of the Gospel Topics essays that um, is chronicled in the introduction to this book. Um, the introduction is called uh, Why the Gospel Topics Essays, and it's basically uh, Matt Harris's uh, attempt to put together a timeline of many of the events that led to the creation of the Gospel Topics Essays. And part of what's a little bit weird, and I'm going to ask everyone's forgiveness on this, as an interviewer, one of the things I always like to try and do is get out of the way and just let my interviewees talk. And sometimes I like to jump in, and sometimes that frustrates people. What's going to be a little bit complicating about this particular interview with Matt is that I was an I was uh, probably a pretty important or big part to the events that that led to uh, the release of the essays. And we're going to talk about all that today. Um, but you, I just need you to forgive me for interjecting myself at the beginning of this interview a bit, uh, because I, I, uh, I have some parts of the timeline that I, that I uh, participated in that, that weave very importantly into uh, the introduction that Matt penned. So without any further ado, Matt Harris, I'm over the moon thrilled to have you back on Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, John. It's always a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm thrilled that you'll be able to participate in today's conversation since you were part of these events. Okay, so anything you want to say about um, as an overview of this book before we dive into the introduction? Yeah, uh, so just just maybe a quick thought about how I came to this project. Um when the LDS Gospel Topics essays were released, there were 13 of them uh, total over roughly a two-year period. And I, like other members of the church and scholars, uh, were interested in these essays, both for what they said and what they didn't say. And really, these essays are the most transparent effort in the history of the church to uh, talk about problematic issues in LDS history and doctrine. So that's what drew me to this. And then our discussion today, we'll talk about how the essays came about and how they were released. And so it was the essays that initially drew me to this project. And then, of course, I wanted to learn sort of the backstory on the essays. And, and that's what the introduction of this book is largely about. Okay. Yeah. And I just have to agree with you. I, I agree that uh, the LDS Church releasing this series of gospel topics essays starting in 2013. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yep. Is something that we've been wanting and begging for, for decades, if not a century, which is the Mormon church to start coming clean about its history. And uh, it was a miracle in many ways for everyone who experienced that. And so I'm just so thrilled that you and signature books along with Newell and all the authors um, of this, uh, of the chapters in this book, um, tackle tackle the subject. Tell us just a bit about what what the chapters are, what, kind of what this book covers. Give us an overview of the book, if you don't mind. 
Yeah, absolutely. So what Newell and I wanted to do is we wanted to produce a series of uh, scholarly essays that looked at the essays and talked about what they did really well and and and, and also talk about uh, parts where they fell short. And one of the most important things in this project was is that we we wanted the tone to be right. We didn't want scholars with an axe to grind. Um, it just it just really wasn't what we wanted to do. And the the um, uh, so the tone had to be right. And I might say parenthetically that there were a couple of three different essays submitted essays, and we just we just couldn't use them. It's not because the scholarship wasn't sound. It's just because there was just too much finger pointing and all of that stuff. And that just so we had to move in a different direction from those those three authors. But anyway, um, so we wanted to look at go into more detail into these essays and talk about uh, points of exploration, uh, maybe down the road. And uh, so the essays uh, were interesting because they're geared to address issues that have been problematic in the church. But there are some essays that um, that were not covered or topics that were not covered. Um, I, I suppose we'll get into that uh, this hour. But anyway, um, we just, Noel and I wanted to get our readers to think more carefully about these essays. And I want to say there's there's a lot of positive things. It's so it's so easy to be critical all the time, to sort of tear down the barn, if you will, and much more uh, labor intensive to rebuild the barn. But I, I really do think that these, these essays are a milestone in LDS um, uh, scholarship, and I think they should be praised as such. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I guess I guess the place to begin is with your introduction, where you try and uh, and cover the history of, of sort of the events that lead to the release of the essays. Yeah. So that you know, I I remember um, we start out the essay with uh, something called the uh, Swedish Rescue Fireside or Swedish Rescue Mission, and um, for those on this who are listening, who don't know what that is, it was a faith crisis that Latter-day Saints of Sweden had in uh, 2008, 2009, and into 2010. And I know, John, you can say more about how this began in just a moment, but it became such an enormous ordeal that, um, that general authorities in Salt Lake City dispatched uh, Marlon Jensen, who was then the church historian and also a member of the first quorum of the 70. And then um, Rick Turley, who worked for the church, who was the assistant church recorder and historian at the time. Anyway, um, they dispatched Turley and Jensen to Sweden in 2000, November 2010 to uh, in a special fireside to listen to the concerns of these Latter-day Saints. And when uh, Turley and Jensen were there, they they were not caught unaware. They knew what they were walking into, that these Latter-day Saints had um, questions, I mean, really challenging questions. And uh, so Turley and Jensen had been preparing for this, and their whole mission was to try to answer their questions and to try to get prevent these folks from leaving the faith. And so really, um, one of the main participants is a guy named Hans Matson, a one-time Area Authority 70 in um, in Sweden, and also a former stake president. So he really had clout in the church, and he he's one of the catalysts who was responsible for this fireside, meaning that he had been talking to people in his uh, ward and stake about his faith crisis. And because he had such a high stature in the church, um, people listened to him, and that's what precipitated Jensen and Turley to come from Salt Lake to Sweden in this special fireside. So it really was a high stakes uh, uh, mission. And Hans told me that there were over 600 Latter-day Saints who were there. And I read somewhere it was by invitation only. So they didn't want to open this up to everybody in Sweden, uh, especially those who were not having a faith crisis. It was really people who had a faith crisis. And when I read that uh, Hans said that there were over 600 people there, I was just absolutely astonished. I can't think of anywhere in the church today, the contemporary LDS church, where such a fireside has occurred, where there are a large group of uh, Latter-day Saints who have special concerns about the church, and then they dispatch a general authority and a church employee, a church historian, uh, to try to assuage those concerns. It really is an, a, it's a, a monumental moment in LDS church history. 
It absolutely is. And so if it's okay, Matt, and I'll ask my listeners for forgiveness, this interview's with Matt, but I'm just going to provide a tiny bit of background because I think it's kind of interesting, maybe a little bit fun and kind of important. Mm -hmm. So, so we all know that, you know, that BH Roberts had his thing in the, in the twenties and thirties. We all know that Fawn Brody comes out with her, with her book in 1945 called No Man Knows My History. And then we all know about, um, you know, dialogue starting in the sixties, the Leonard Arrington years in the seventies, you know, Sunstone starting in the seventies and then it all getting kind of shut down in the eighties. And then we all know about the September six in the nineties. So like all of that happens. And, and, you know, basically what it says is there have been these small groups of people talking in depth about Mormon history for decades and decades and decades, but somehow curiously, miraculously, perniciously, all of this conversation sort of remains hidden from the general church membership for, for almost that whole period. It's always just sort of these strains of Mormon intelligentsia or critics, but the larger church membership is sort of unaware of all this stuff, um, in my opinion. And so when I have my faith crisis, you know, I, I watched the September 6th at BYU in 93, you know, I get married and have kids. But then in 2000, when I have my faith crisis, the internet's just starting to come out. I'm working at Microsoft. The internet's out. I have my faith crisis. I try and get support and there's no one to support me. And by the way, I could not have had my faith crisis if it weren't for signature books, you know, Simon Southerton, Grant Palmer, Michael Quinn, Richard Bushman, all these authors, Fawn Brody, all these authors that had written these amazing books that, again, almost no one's read unless you're just really into this stuff. So by 2003, 2004, you know, I'm just depressed thinking I have to dedicate my life to helping people become aware of these issues. As a church, we need to talk about it. We need to come clean. And, uh, you know, the Internet is the way. You know what I mean? So I leave Microsoft in 2004. I go to Sunstone that summer in 2004. I meet Dan Witherspoon. I meet with the Dialogue Board. I join the Sunstone Board. And I'm like, hey, Dialogue Sunstone, we need to use the internet to get all this amazing history out to the world. And, um, and so I start Mormon Stories in 2005. And the only reason I'm mentioning all that is because this was a really important moment that led to the Swedish rescue, as I understand it. And so from 2005 to 2006, I interviewed Greg Prince. I interviewed Richard Bushman. I interviewed Grant Palmer. I interviewed Darren Smith. I do a bunch of LGBTQ interviews. I interviewed Darius, and, Darius Gray and Margaret Young. Um, you know, Richard Bushman by 2007, Claudia Bushman. And the goal is to just like, and this, this, happens in parallel with all these Mormon blogs that are coming out. So there's Times and Seasons blog, By Common Consent blog. So the blog thing starts happening, then the podcast thing starts happening, and we start to get traction on the internet um, about uh, all these issues. And uh, even in 2006, I created a little prototype web page called the Top 10 Tough Issues in Mormonism. And it's a precursor to Mormon Think. And I basically put out a call to my listeners. It's like, hey, we need a website that lists all the tough issues in Mormonism and explanations for and against why these are problems. So all this stuff starts cooking in 2005, 2006, 2007. Um, when I receive an email from this incredible woman, this is January 6, 2008, Christina Andersen Hanke from Sweden reaches out to me. And she basically says, hey, John, I just found your podcast. And uh, I, I can't tell you how much it means to me. I've been having a faith crisis. And my bishop encouraged my husband of like 25 plus years to leave me over my faith crisis. And uh, I shared that email with you this morning, Matt. But for me, that's when I started realizing, whoa, that's interesting. I've got listeners in Sweden. Who knew, mm -hmm. right? And from there, Christina Hanke, and I should mention, Hans Madsen's released as an area authority in 2005. And at some point, he meets up with Christina. So by 2008, 2009, there's like this Swedish study group where they're starting to study the Bible, but also they start studying problems with church history. 
and that's and then Mormon Think is born in 2008. I meet with Elder Holland about faith crisis issues in June of 2009, and then in March of 2010, and all this stuff starts boiling by the time I, re I receive, um, I'm friended by Hans Matson in November 18th, 2010, which is 10 days before the Swedish Rescue meeting happens. So, so this is kind of just a little bit of backstory about how I, I'm pretty sure that a combination of the internet, Mormon stories, Christina Hanke, Hans, starts this festering group in Sweden that leads to uh, the Swedish rescue that happens in 2010, which you, uh, which you told me about, and which you mentioned at the beginning. But also, it was so fun because Christina and I were in contact at this point, and she sent me minutes of her meeting at the Swedish rescue just within a week after it happened. She types up all her notes. She sends it to me. I find out that they did an audio recording of the Swedish rescue. And this is all like uh, was really exciting stuff at the time. Now, one other thing I'll just mention is earlier on, one of my listeners reached out to me named Travis Stratford. Travis is this brilliant um, graphic designer, uh, PR marketing guy that start started a company with a bunch of BYU grads called Studio Case um, in New York City. Uh, in you know the mid 2000s, and Travis actually, Travis Stratford actually designed the Mormon Stories logo that um, that I used very early on in Mormon Stories. So Travis and I become friends, and it turns out that Travis had served his mission in Sweden. So when Hans reaches out to me by 2000 and and uh, 10, Travis gets in touch with Hans, and Hans says, you know, we got to do something about all this. And so, um, you know, Travis and I are following the Swedish Rescue meeting. You know, we get the audio and we start thinking, what can we do? You know, how do we connect with Hans? And is there any opportunity here? And long story short, at some point, uh, Hans reaches out to me and Travis. He introduces himself to us and he says, I want to hold a meeting. I want to hold a meeting in New York City and it's going to be me, Hans, you, Travis, John DeLynn, and Marlon Jensen, because Hans Madsen had met Marlon Jensen during the years Marlon Jensen was working in Europe while Hans Madsen was an area authority. And Jeffrey Holland was there back at the time as well. And so uh, this is really exciting for me because I'm like, oh my gosh, finally I'll have audience, you know, with Marlon Jensen, church historian, and we'll be able to let him know that there are serious, serious problems with people losing their faith and the church's disclosure of history and all the carnage, all the family and personal carnage that's happening as people lose their faith. And the church just acts like this doesn't even exist and they keep hiding their history. So um, in March of 2011, um, uh, that's, when, that's when this meeting takes place. And um, in preparation for that meeting, uh, Travis and I realized that there needs to be, you know, data, that, that it would be a much more powerful meeting if we actually go to that meeting with data. And so I, um, I designed, Travis and I, uh, along with Greg Prince's help, designed a uh, survey uh, that we release uh, on the internet in like over 3,000 followers of Mormon stories, people on Facebook, people in ex-Mormon world, they all respond to this survey. And we assemble, I, I, I pull together a team of uh, researchers, Morgan McCune and Scott Hawley and all these amazing, uh, you know, statistics-minded PhDs. We crunch the numbers and we come up with a bunch of data that gets packaged by Travis into a presentation that gets presented in New York City to Marlon Jensen by Travis and Greg. And one of the huge sad points for me was that I got disinvited from that meeting. My understanding is that Greg Prince felt like Marlon would feel more comfortable if I wasn't there. So I got disinvited, Greg, Greg replaced me, and that super important meeting happened in New York City where Marlon Jensen was sort of put on notice that this was a huge problem and what I understand about that meeting 
is that his eyes bulged when we showed the education level and the average income of the people who were losing their faith because it was the most highly educated and the highest income members of the church who were losing their faith. And I remember Travis and Greg telling me that Marlon Jensen's response was, we're losing the, our best and our brightest. And that was sort of that first initial wake-up call that happened in New York City um, that, that was a big impetus for, for all of this stuff. Let me say something, uh, just jump in real quick, John, that um, Travis told me, and this is, this is in the book, but Marlon Jensen was absolutely floored when he saw some of the data that Travis had presented in New York City. He was just stunned. And I think it's important to know that Marlon Jensen, uh, he didn't do this on his own accord. He went with the blessing of Apostle Boyd K. Packer. And this is how serious, at least internally, they're, they're starting to take this, is that Jensen didn't think he could do this without his superiors signing off on it. And um, if we can just go back to the, the, the uh, Swedish rescue just for a moment, that um, when the Swedish Latter-day Saints, they had a three-hour meeting, and they were just... It started out with uh, Elder Jensen bearing his testimony. I mean, really spending a lengthy amount of time bearing his testimony about the church. And finally, one of the Swedes became impatient. And they basically said, look, we've heard you bear your testimony. Can we ans ask our questions now? And so um, they just, over the next three hours, there was just a barrage of questions about the Book of Abraham, the Book of Mormon, polygamy, polyandry, any kind of hot spot in the church. It came up and it was at that meeting where Elder Jensen and Rick Turley, they said they tried to do their best, the best that they could to answer the questions. It was mostly Rick Turley um, who was uh, addressing the doctrinal questions. But uh, Jensen said that there were answers to their questions and they were forthcoming. There was a committee underway putting some of these answers together. And the committee, again, was led by uh, Boyd K. Packer at his uh, authorization. So this was really being done at the highest echelons of the church. And the questions that Jensen and Turley had talked about that were forthcoming at this November 2010 Swedish fireside, those would later become the Gospel Topics essays. So just to give you a timeline in all of this, this is in November of 2010, and the first essay is not released until November of 2013, three years later. And so there's a lengthy process, and we can talk about, you know, some of the, the problems and difficulties um, with all of this. I want to share uh, something that's, I think, important to the story is um, you have a backstory with Travis. I want to share with your listeners, John, how I came in contact with Travis, because quite frankly, I couldn't have probably have done the introduction in this book had I not had the assistance of Travis, who gave me his questions or his surveys. And there's probably three different ones. I mean, they're really thick files and really it should be published somewhere if they haven't already been yet. But anyway, um, so I gave a, a, a talk at the Mormon History Association Conference in Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, and I think 2017, June of 2017. And uh, there was a lot of people in the room and obviously in the Mormon scholarly community, the gospel topics essays um, are important. And I noticed that there were a couple of general authorities in the room. There were several employees of the LDS Church History Department. And no pressure, right? Writing, talking about contemporary events of which you were not a part, but yet the people in the room were. And um, I used to be in my first part of my career, I wrote about uh, uh, the founding fathers and people from the 19th century. And they were easy to write about because they were dead. They didn't fight back. But um <laughs> With uh, current people in the room, you know, there's there could be some pushback. So one of the things I said was, as I began my remarks, I said that I understand that there are several people in the room, including general authorities, who participated directly in the construction and dissemination of this project. I welcome feedback. I welcome criticism. I want to get this story right. So after my talk today, please, please, please come see me. If I said something wrong or I misconstrued something or just come see me, please. So I gave the, the presentation and 
the first person who came up to me after my remarks was Elder Stephen Snow, who had replaced Marlon Jensen as the church historian. And like Elder Jensen, Elder Snow was a general authority. He's now retired. He retired, I think, last summer. But anyway, Elder Snow came up and he uh, pulled me aside in the corner and he, uh, he, he proceeded to tell me the backstory of the Gospel Topics essays. He said, we took a lot of heat for trying to push these essays out and get them published. And I played stupid and I said, who's we? And who's giving you the heat? And he said, uh, Boyd Packer. And then he lifts up his shirt to show me a scar mark that he had, you know, from, from Packer. And by that point, I took out my phone and I said, okay, can you speak in the record here? I want to get you on. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed and we both laughed. Um, but so after we uh, exchanged some banter um, uh, between us, he, he said, have you ever heard of Travis Stratford? And I said, no, I don't know who he is. He said, you really, really need to get in touch with him because he was instrumental in getting these essays released to the public. They were not going to release them. And Travis was instrumental. I won't tell you any more than that. Talk to Travis. And so I tracked down Travis. And, and uh, it was nice to hear you, John, talk about your relationship with Travis. Because once I, I called Travis and I said, you know, a general authority said I had to get in touch with you, that you've got some important things to say. Then Travis had Travis and I had numerous conversations over the course of, oh, I guess it might have been 2018, the summer of 2018. We talked at length. We shared a lot of emails. and. He was um, instrumental in not only releasing all of the surveys to me with some very useful qualitative data, but also he constructed a timeline that you're cooperating, John, um, about who did what and where and helping me keep everything straight. And so Travis was really um, pivotal in all of this. And one of these days, I understand that he's going to go on record and, and share this story. But, but what you find in the Gospel Topics essays is um, Travis is doing. And I ought to say that um, uh, I, I try to keep people's names out of it. I talk to general authorities about my work and especially behind the scenes stuff. And sometimes they request to, you know, anonymity, which is great. I always try to honor that. But I had two different general authorities pull me aside at different various occasions. And they said, Travis is the guy who pushed this forward and got him released to the public. That was sort of what they said. And um, anyway, it was, so that was, I think that's an important part of the story. It was the, it was the work of um, a diligent Latter-day Saint who had experienced his own faith crisis, who wanted to get the church to take this seriously. And, and the fact that, um, that Boyd Packer was aware of this and had commissioned the essays and had allowed Elder Jensen to go to New York City uh, to meet with Greg Prince and Travis and Hans Matson, I think that's really, I mean, it's important. It's an important detail that's, that's lost to the church body. But certainly the apostles were aware of this. And I, uh, I want to say something else, too, is so... These are the essays that start to germinate in 2010, and they're not officially released until 2013. But um, the church had been, have, been experiencing these issues for a number of decades. And just to build what you said, John, is that, you know, in the 20s and 30s and 40s, you see the church, church apostles like John Witso and Joseph Fielding Smith, they publish um, uh, answers to gospel questions in uh, the church magazines like the Improvement Era. Now, notice what they say, answers to gospel questions. They don't say difficult gospel questions, but certainly gospel questions. And, and if you look at some of these um, in the Improvement Era from Witso first and jo Joseph Fielding Smith, who was also a church historian, if you look at them, um, some of them were just speculative, you know, stuff that most people might not care about. Um, some of it would be considered controversial. They're asking about Adam God. Did Brigham Young really teach that Adam is God? So you do get some of that in the in the church um, enzyme. This is in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and well into the 1960s. And then after the 60s, um, you mostly get private letters from apostles to concerned church members about various doctrinal issues. And um, And then by the 1990s, uh, and there could have been earlier books. I'm, and somebody will correct me if I, if I, if I'm remiss here. But by the 1990s, you start to get books by Desert Book, the LDS Church Publishing House, publishing books with the the term "difficult" or "problematic" in the title. Answers to difficult gospel questions. 
I'm thinking of Joseph Fielding McConkie's book in 1998. And I remember reading that book. Uh, I was in graduate school at the time in New York. And I read the book and I had a number of questions. And so I wrote uh, Joseph Fielding McConkie a note. Um, and basically, the questions were, you know, you're saying X. What about Apostle Y? And typical Joseph Fielding McConkie was a chip off the old block. Basically blew it off. You know, it's whatever my father said and my grandfather. And uh, of course, his grandfather was Joseph Fielding Smith. So Joseph Fielding McConkie was uh, not surprisingly wedded to his father's teachings and his grandfather's teachings. And when they contradicted other apostles' teachings, eh, didn't matter. We can just shove those aside. But anyway, um, answers to difficult gospel questions. And uh, this is 1998. And then after 2004, the advent of the, the Internet, if you will, or the rise of the Internet, at least with uh, among Mormons, uh, when Mormons start to read on the Internet um, the Journal of Discourses for the first time, previously only known to scholars or people who had access to those that multi-volume uh, set at a research library, for example, or if they were visiting Salt Lake. But for the most part, the Journal of Discourses and other challenging Mormon documents from the 19th century, they weren't available to the average member until the internet. And so when the internet started to publish the Journal of Discourses and other challenging uh, LDS writings from earlier uh, church leaders, it creates this incredible um, challenge for the church, uh, which is to say that Latter-day Saints can, can see directly stuff online from Brigham Young's own mouth. And if an apostle was saying something otherwise, then it became a challenge. So Bruce McConkie is a great example. In the 1970s, he wrote a, a member, just a private letter between an apostle and a member, saying that Brigham Young did not teach that Adam was God. Later, he would revise that and, and, and backtrack and admit to it and say that Brigham Young was wrong. But initially, Bruce McConkie, uh, Apostle McConkie, denied that. And um, But today, of course, you can spend two seconds and go find the many discourses that Brigham Young talked about that Adam was God. And um, so that's really a, a, a challenge that the church has never, ever had to deal with prior to the advent of the Internet. So what happens is after 2004, you get this uh, steady stream of books that pop up. And I'll just read a couple of them that I think the readers might find. Um, uh, in 1998, Joseph Fielding McConkie, as I mentioned, it's called Answers, Straightforward Answers to Tough Gospel Questions. And then six years later, um, BYU professor Bob Millett uh, published a book called Getting at the Truth, Responding to Difficult Questions about LDS Beliefs. And then it was followed by No Weapon Shall Prosper, New Light on Sensitive Issues. And then after the faith crisis stuff starts to trickulate out in 2015, we get a new sense of, of books. Uh, the Givens is Terrell and Fiona, his wife, called uh, The Crucible of Doubt, Reflections on the Quest of Faith. Then we get uh, Planted, Belief, Navigating LDS Doctrine and Church History from Utah State scholar Patrick Mason. We get Letters to a Young Mormon by a Mormon philosopher named Adam Miller. And so, and then we also get a, um, a really a, a push to look at apologetic websites like um, the Interpreter Foundation website, um, the Neil A. Maxwell uh, website. So the church is trying to use its resources to combat the internet. And it's, it's really, uh, it is a challenge because there is so much out there on the internet. There, there are so many primary sources out there that one can go to. It's one thing to have a secondary source written by a scholar who didn't live in the period, and quite another to go see the horse's mouth and people could read it, you know, the, the writings unfiltered. And so that's the challenge that the church has had to deal with. And this is one of the many reasons why they decided to uh, release these gospel topics essays is because they wanted the, the, the membership to know that they understood that these issues were out there and they wanted to acknowledge them, whereas previously they had either not acknowledged them or significantly downplayed them. And so uh, I think it's important to recognize that these LDS Gospel Topics essay questions or essays, it's a, it's a good, faith, good faith effort for the church to come clean about its past. And, um, and, and they're a remarkable set of essays. Let me just give you one example why it's important. And then we'll talk about the race and priesthood essay later. Um, but for years, Latter-day Saints had been teaching that... Um, uh, it, it, after the priesthood revelation of 1978, the brethren tried to get away from um, some of those past teachings. And um, 
about uh, the curse of Cain and our blacks less value the pre-existence. The revelation itself says nothing about any of that stuff. So what's left after the revelation is you've got all of this residue in the street or debris in the street that, that, that's not been cleaned up. It's not been addressed. And the idea is, is that blacks can go to the temple now and, and worthy men can hold the priesthood. That, that's all fine and well. But what about all of this racial baggage, this, this racial doctrine that had been accumulating over time? What about that? And this is what the church has to deal with in the 80s and 90s. And you get a number of Latter-day Saints, well-intentioned, to be, to be fair, well-intentioned Latter-day Saints who would say to black people, hey, don't worry about the curse. God lifted it in 1978. And they don't realize how deeply offensive it is to think that your, your skin color is a sign of a divine curse. And so, um, so for years, as these stories began to trickle into church headquarters, mostly by uh, devout Latter black Latter-day Saints, uh, bearing their souls to the apostles about how offensive it was to be told that they were less valiant and they were cursed. And the story was always, don't worry, brother, you can hold the priesthood and go to the temple. And then they would write back and they would say, I understand that I can go to the temple and hold the priesthood. That's not what this is about. What I want to know, does the church still teach that I'm cursed? And this is the predicament the brother and her in. So what you get by the late 80s and into the early 90s is you get private letters by apostles like Dallin Oaks and Neil Maxwell and Gordon Hinckley, who was then LDS church president. They're writing black people and they're saying that um, basically that's not a church teaching, don't worry about it. Well, this is done in private and the larger church body does not have access to these private letters. And so when somebody would say something racist at church, like, you know, black people are cursed or less valiant, of course it's so offensive to our, our black and our brown brothers and sisters. And um, other than to say this is racist and wrong, they had nothing to appeal to. If they went to Desert Book, they could still see Mormon doctrine on the bookshelves. They could still see Joseph Fielding Smith's Doctrines of Salvation, all of which talked about the curse. And so, um, and, and also progressive Latter-day Saints too, I want to be clear, who were offended by this. And so, but they didn't have anything to appeal to. And now by 2013, when the race and priesthood document comes out, it explicitly condemns and repudiates this notion of a divine curse and that black people were less valiant. So that if somebody says at church that, that um, you know, they're quoting some general authority from years past about the curse, um, a proper position would be, hey, look, that's not true. We've got a document that says otherwise. And I, I, I don't think that can be understated about how important that is to give Latter-day Saints an authoritative document to which they could use when some of their well-intentioned Latter-day Saint brothers and sisters utter racial epithets towards them. Absolutely. So um, so I want to just do do my part to give, give a couple shout-outs, uh, and then we can move on. I want to talk to you just about the essays in general, but but uh, Travis was absolutely kind of like the the mastermind. I think Greg Prince played a really important role in advising. I think Greg had a friendship with Marlon, and I think uh, Greg played a really important advisory role. I think the Swedish, all those Swedish saints, those Swedish progressive and post Mormons and Hans and Birgitta Matson, they were crucial. Um, and and frankly, Marlon Jensen, uh, what a courageous guy to, to want to take this on. And then I'm, you know, I'm very grateful to have been able to play a role both with the Swedish rescue with Hans, but also with Travis and doing the research recruiting for the sample. And then I met with Marlon Jensen as well prior to, um, you know, the essays, I think being formally approved. And I just want to say it's one of, and all the research team that helped us crunch that data that then got presented to church headquarters. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit more about what you say in your book about how, you know, Travis brought brought the book to Uchtdorf and others and, and what that led to. But I just want to say that, you know, uh, I, I that's one of the things I'm most proud of and all the things that I've done is to be a part of that team with Travis, Hans, Marlon, you know, Greg Prince, all the Swedish rescue people. 
because uh, that was an exciting time. And, and our hope was, was that the church would come clean. Because from our perspective, by 2011, I've seen how many suicides had taken place. I've seen how many divorces had happened. I'd seen how, how much family carnage. Because of my role in Mormon Stories and all the people that reached out to me, it, it was becoming untenable, the amount of pain and suffering that this faith crisis issue was causing. And so it was a really heady time to be working with the former area authority, to be working with Marlon Jensen, to be working with Travis and Greg Prince to make all this happen. And uh, so talk, if you don't mind, uh, and so shout out to Travis, you're the man, everyone else. Talk about uh, what, what you say in your book, if you if you happen to recall, I know you wrote it a couple of years ago, just about, um, you know, Quentin Cook and and uh, Uchtdorf and how they play into the story. Yeah. So uh, before I do that, John, I want to just so you're absolutely right. There there are a handful of people in this story. Um, you included, of course. And as as I note in the in the essay, and Travis is central to a lot of this, as is Marlon Jensen, and Greg Prince, who with whom I work putting this together. He shared some valuable insights about his experiences. But also, I want to just give a shout out to one other person. I try to honor confidences. So um, so I can't release the name of this person. But there was an LDS uh, professor who played a role, um, both funding and otherwise. It's it's an enormous undertaking to put together a, a rigorous sample size to make some meaningful conclusions about anything, really, in this case, why people are leaving the church. And so it's not just you know something that a couple of amateurs can do on their own. It, it just takes a lot of money. So anyway, this LDS professor had ponied up some of his own cash and um, also consulted on the design of it and the kinds of questions that needed to be asked. And I want to be clear to your readers, we're talking. there's probably three different samples going on here. Um, one of the ones that, of course, John, you did with uh, Travis early on and that Craig participated, Greg Prince participated in, but also there were a couple of other later ones. And that was enormous for me to sort of straighten all this out. Why were there three different samples and who's doing what and where do they go? And so Travis was instrumental in helping me to untangle all of that. But anyway, but there was an LDS professor that um, played a, a role in this that uh, wanted to remain anonymous. So that's going to honor that wish. Um, so, uh, so this is all about connections, working personal connections. And Elder Jensen, of course, I think we've talked about it already that there were connections worked with him that Hans Monson knew him, put him in touch with you and Travis. Um, Greg Prince knew him. And it was also about, um, I want to back up just for a moment that that after the essays were talked about at the Swedish Rescue Fireside, that the church leaders knew they had to put these essays together. There's no question this was only going to get worse before it was going to get better. It, it was not something that you could just sort of shove aside and tell the Swedes what they want to hear and and then just don't produce the essays. So, uh, and that's not what I'm applying. I, I think the church was sincere from the, the get-go to, to do these essays. The question is, what do you say in these essays? What uh, subjects do you tackle? And um, what do you not say? Because, of course, the church is about producing faith and testimony. And it's already challenging enough to deal with some of these thorny topics about polyandry and polygamy and Adam God or, or just choose one. And the reason why it's thorny is because, as I said at the onset of the show today, that the church leaders had either uh, deliberately said that they, they weren't doing these things or teaching these things, or they had significantly downplayed them. And now they're going to go on record and go in a different direction. And they were worried about producing a faith crisis. The irony of all of this is it's supposed to stave off faith crisis, but they were worried about producing a faith crisis. That Latter-day Saints would be exposed to polyandry for the first time when they had never heard of it. And now they, they, they spiral out of control and ultimately leave the church. That, that was a real issue for the authorities. They did want to do more damage. And so... Um, so what the, what happened was is that um, Elder Jensen um, and Greg Prince, who knows some of the apostles, they decided that uh, Uchtdorf would be one of the Dieter Uchtdorf, who was then in the first presidency. He would be one of the most open to receiving these um, essays, and also Quentin Cook got a um, a copy, 
And uh, but Uchtdorf in particular, and Travis uh, shared an interesting story with me that um, it was August of 2013. So just to give you a sense of the timeline, this is just a few months before the essays were released, and they didn't know. Can I, can I back up for just one second? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just just because I think it, and you mentioned this in your book, just because I think it's an important part of the timeline. Yeah. So. So as I understand it, the meeting in New York City happened in the fall of 2012. Yes. That's when we presented the findings of, of the, the research called uh, that, that, that I and, and a group of researchers put together called Understanding Mormon Disbelief Survey. That was the data that was released and was given to Marlon Jensen at the time. That was the first study of the studies you reference, right? And then- And your study, John, by the way, was published- and I think the spring of 2012, it was put online. And this yeah, was, it was May May of 2012. May of 2012. And this is the first time that I found, and nobody's corrected me on this, but this is the first, your study initially with, with Travis is the first systematic attempt by any Latter-day Saint to try to quantify why people are leaving the church. And I think that's an important issue. The church has been tracking this stuff internally for a long time. But this is stuff that's thrown away in the vault under lock and key, and they don't want to know any of this. Let me, if I can give it just a quick, quick backstory. In the late 1990s, I remember going to a priesthood meeting with uh, Apostle Holland. I was at a meeting with Elder Holland. So this would have been 97, maybe. And he, he said at this priesthood meeting, so this is a private meeting before the internet. And Elder Holland said that um, his, his, he was in town because his, uh, his daughter and his son-in-law uh, lived in our ward in New York. Anyway, so I got to know him a little bit. And um, I used to teach a Sunday school class and he used to, he would come to my class and I would always turn to him and just ask him questions. The worst, most annoying thing you could do, just sit there and pick on an apostle. But anyway, he was good natured about it. <laughs> um, but I went to this priesthood meeting and he recognized that there was a faith crisis. And this is 97 or 98, probably 98 recognize there is a faith crisis then. And that was really interesting to, I think, probably most of us in the room, because here you have an apostle that is really giving you a sneak peek behind the curtain, which sort of belies the church narrative that the the the, the kingdom is like one big rock rolling down and getting stronger and more powerful as it goes. Well, at, dur during that session, the, the kingdom was a pebble and it wasn't doing very well. And he was very honest and forthright about some internal documents that he referenced in his his priesthood. Uh, it wasn't a lesson, but his his talk about that the church had been doing research. So this is all internal stuff. And so fast forward to March of 2012 and the stuff that you were working on, John. Um, when you uh, released this on the internet in May of 2012, um, that's the first look where people, a chance when people get a look to think, this is why people are leaving. They're leaving over doctrinal issues and transparency issues. And, and the reason why that's important is that if you look at the writings of general authorities prior to that point, um, what it always talked about was they left because they got their feelings hurt. They were offended. They wanted to go party. They wanted to drink. They wanted to, all of this stuff. It put the onus on the member. It was somehow their behavior that had made them leave. And really what the surveys, yours first, and then the subsequent surveys were revealing was, is that the onus is now on the church. And I think that for, for not being more transparent about its teachings. And that is a fundamental point. And that's why I think that these, these surveys are really important. Yeah, yeah. And... Um... Yeah. And so the, the, I wanted to talk about Cook before we talk about Uchtdorf, just because I, I think that was important in your book. So so the meeting happens in fall of 2011. I'm just trying to get my dates right. Then I meet, but then but then it, we it's kind of silence and we don't hear anything. And then in January, I meet with Marlon Jensen at Utah State University. And that's at the same time that Marlon Jensen gives that little um, – lecture at, on Utah State University campus. I had a friend record that lecture. And that's when that's when Marlon Jensen makes that comment that the church is experiencing its greatest apostasies since the time of Kirtland. And that was a significant statement, right? 
Matt? Oh, like, th that is huge. And the reason why it's huge is that Elder Jensen, of course, is speaking to a private group of Latter-day Saints at the Institute. And um, again, it, I, I don't, I'm not here to be critical today. It's just not, not what I want to do or who I am. But the church has tried to put out this message that all is well, right? That the church is going down the mountain like a big rock and getting stronger. And, and um, it didn't help that when a sociologist from the 1980s predicted there would be 50 million Mormons by 2020 or 2030 or something like that. So there's a lot of hoopla with church growth and testimony building. And really uh, what you got with Elder Jensen is the same thing we got with Elder Holland, that there, there are problems and they're recognizing them privately. And when um, Elder Jensen made that comment, it's an extraordinary comment that the church is having the greatest faith crisis since Kirtland. And uh, that's huge because in LDS church history, of course, a lot of Latter-day Saints, including church leaders, had left the church in Kirtland in the 1830s. So for him to use that Kirtland as a symbol and as a comparison was extraordinary. And once it got taped, and John, I'm sure you can add a detail or two to this, but once it got taped um, and that tape was put on the Internet, of course, the media picks up on this and they publish stories about Elder Jensen's talk. Now, keep in mind, this is supposed to be private. And um, Elder Jensen, I haven't talked to him about this, but I can only imagine he was just crushed when this is talked and leaked to the public because this is something that, that was not supposed to be for public years. And especially, and the media picks up on it. And I'm told through a, a mutual friend of, of ours, Jensen and, and of mine, that, uh, that Jensen got in a lot of trouble with that that when he said that and it got leaked to the public um, and the press picked up on it and wrote about it, this is a confession that, that the church leaders did not want confessed in public. And um, we'll get to Uchtdorf in a minute, but this is the same thing that will happen to Dieter Uchtdorf um, when he does something similar in um, October of 2013. And of course, just like Richard Bushman had to walk back uh, his statement that, that, the, that the, the church's prevailing narrative you know, was untrue and, and it was unsustainable. And then he walked that back once that got released. I think Marlon Jensen tried to walk back or recontextualize his comments as well because he gets in trouble. And this is this is one of the things that is a constant theme on Mormon stories is that the brethren just don't come clean and, and they always have to try and hide and spin and recontextualize instead of just telling the full truth, which is ironically what the Mormon church taught us to do is to tell the full truth, right? So, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah I was just going to say real quick, this is how big this is. I can't, I don't think we can underestimate how important the, the media coverage is from Jensen's talk. So let me give you the quote. And I'll, uh, this is in the book, um, the quote, and then the exact quote, and then the, the, the newspaper coverage. So he said, quote, this is to the LDS um, Institute students at Utah State in January of 2012. Elder Jensen said, quote, not since Kirtland have we seen such an exodus of the church's best and brightest leaders. So that's the that's the statement that really said a ripple effect throughout the LDS community. And then the Washington Post picked up on this story. So it's like this this admission or this confession had initiated a wave of unflattering news coverage. The Washington Post ran a story about uh, talked about Jensen a little bit but then talked about a former BYU student who, quote, spiritually exploded when confronted with challenging material on LDS history and doctrine. And then the Salt Lake Tribune um, ran a story that said that, quote, more and more members of the Utah-based Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are leaving the fold, feeling betrayed by what they find online. And then finally, a special Reuters report stated that Mormonism is being besieged by the modern age. Those three news reports uh, prompted uh, Terrell Givens, a, a respected LDS scholar, to concede that, quote, this is a real crisis. It is an epidemic. And then Joanna Brooks, another uh, well-respected LDS scholar, she wrote, quote, that it is time to come to terms with church history. And so all of these, these writings were published in newspapers within just a few weeks after um, Elder Jensen made this comment. And one of the things that the brethren don't like, of course, is who, who does really, but
but they don't like unflattering um, news coverage. And um, I guess I'm going to, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to do it today. Um, you know, it's honesty is always, 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 always the best policy. If you're honest, you really don't have to worry about as much as you do if you're not honest. And what I mean by that is if the church would say, yeah, we've got some challenges ahead of us. We, some of our leaders taught things in the past that we no longer teach today. And, and uh, some of our members find this out on the internet and we, we have to deal with it. We have to work with them to let them know that this is, that was the church then in say the 19th century. And here's the church today in the 21st century. And instead of taking that policy, I think most people are forgiving. I think that most Latter-day Saints can understand that the church was different. That if a leader ushered a racist statement or said something crazy about um, something sexist or whatever from a different time period, we could chalk that up to a, a function of their generation. And I, I don't think that that's hard to process. The difficulty is when you're trying to pretend that something is not going on when you know that it is. and that's really the challenge with with church leaders today is is how do they recognize and deal with some of the controversial things that leaders had taught in the past without destroying somebody's faith and even as we speak today on this podcast um, leaders in Salt Lake have different views about how to do this some are more open and transparent and some are less transparent and one of the uh, your your listeners might find this um, interesting but one of the the, the people that was that wanted and advocated for a transparent history was um, oddly enough Bruce R. McConkie. In the 1980s, he uh, took a much different view than his good friend Boyd Packer and also Ezra Taft Benson. Uh, Bruce McConkie said that if we uh, don't tell our history uh, by our own historians and we're not honest about it, somebody else will tell it for us. We would rather have our people do it than them. And for whatever reason, um, Elder Packer and Elder Benson won the day. And that's, they're the two biggest proponents of telling a faith promoting history. And um, they're also the two of the biggest proponents who wanted to shut down the church histor historian's office and, um, and relegate church historian Leonard Arrington to the margins. So anyway, there's been some different voices among the high church leadership about how transparent one needs to be. And, and I know from various friends that I have who know some of the apostles, the brethren, that um, some of those conversations are still taking place today. Yeah, and indeed, in in that original, uh, you know, why Mormons disbelief, uh, understanding Mormon disbelief survey, you know, of course, you know, we, we asked the biggest issues, you know, polygamy, polyandry, Book of Abraham, you know, masonry, all peep stones, all the problems, but there was a there was a uber theme, which was the feeling of being deceived. There are a lot of people that said, you know, I could have handled polygamy, I could have handled blacks yeah. in the priesthood. What I can't handle is that I feel like the church intentionally and systematically deceived me, and that's not forgivable. And and that's that's what many people felt. Yeah, I, I think so. I um, and and uh, you know, it's funny. Um, and that's why the essays were an attempt to fix that. Right? We can't keep deceiving people. Well, it's true. And Terrell Gibbons has a great quote that we that I note in this essay. He said something about if you're 50 years old and you've been in the church your entire life, you've been to seminary, you've been on a mission, married in the temple, been active in the church. And all of a sudden at age 50, you find that Joseph Smith buried his hat, his head in a hat to translate the Book of Mormon, and he used a, a seer stone. That's problematic. That's challenging, right? It it it's it contradicts the narrative he had been hearing his whole life. And the truth is, the, <laughs> Mormons probably aren't any more weirder than anybody else in terms of some of the supernatural beliefs that, that Christians and maybe Muslims or Jews believe. When I say weird, I'm just talking about hard to understand to the, um, the, the eye. It doesn't make sense rationally. And that's what religion is. It's We, we take religion on faith, right? Well, anyway... Um, so if you grow up with a certain narrative your entire life, and then all of a sudden one day when you're surfing the internet and you find something that challenges that narrative, you, you have a faith crisis. And Terrell Givens' uh, point is, and one in which I fully endorse, which is if you just work that into the narrative as you go along, teach the kids in seminary that this is how Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. He looked in a hat. And if you can sort of inoculate them against that early on and work that into the narrative, 
then there won't be a faith crisis at the age of 50. And I think what you see now is a church having to work backwards to address some of those issues. But um, my sense is that once people leave the church, they're out, they're gone. And the church has data on this um, that uh, I don't want to speculate too much because I don't have the report. But years ago, there was a study done at BYU um, among some of the sociologists had done a study it was commissioned by the church. And they looked at what it would take to keep people in the church. And not surprisingly, there were Latter-day Saints were more likely to stay in the church if they went to BYU, which is one of the reasons why they want to keep this under wraps, right? If it gets out that you're more likely to stay in the church if you stay at BYU and your kid gets rejected at BYU, now you have your, your own faith crisis. He's going to leave the church. Right. Ah. Yeah. Um, anyway, they're more likely to pay tithing. They're more likely to go on a, uh, go on a mission. And I don't quote me on the details on this. It's been a long time since I talked with one of the, the authors of this. But um, the idea was that if you can, if they can get them to the mission, there was a strong chance that if they served a faithful mission, they would marry in the temple and stay in the church. And they had data to support all of this stuff. So it's uh, th this really, in, in many ways, um, addresses this notion of why the church pushes so hard for kids to get on missions is because the data suggests they're more likely to be a tight paying member and to stay and remain active and, and serve in their church callings if they go on a mission. And, um, and that's why the church has been, I think, transparent in this regard, uh, that missions are for the missionary as much as anything else, as much as, you know, bringing somebody into the faith, it's to save their own soul. So, um, the churches, they've been data mined for a long time, but this has been, this has all been done internally away from the earshot of the, the fold. If we, if we can go back to um, the internet for a moment and Quentin Cook, uh, John, and then resume the timeline, is that okay? Yeah, it's exactly where I was wanting to go. So basically I'll just say this final thing and that's that uh, I meet with Marlon Jensen um, in January of 2012 uh, that's sort of like, hey, we met with you last fall. Nothing's happened. We've given you the data. And he says to me, give me a little bit more time and, I, and I'll and i keep working on the brethren. And so that's when Marlon Jensen brings Travis Stratford to Salt Lake City. And Travis presents to like all of the major governing bodies of church administration with church PR, with the historical department, with curriculum, with, with correlation, with the missionary department. Travis goes to Mordor, no, church headquarters, and he presents to all the managing directors of all the major departments. And Quinton Cook and L. Tom Perry were there, as I understand it, in that meeting and got the information. And so that was a real that was just a real highlight for all of this because it's like, wow, not only do we meet with Jensen, but Jensen brought our team into church headquarters, presented, and it got presented to apostles. And what Marlon Jensen told me was that he needed the data and Travis to help push over the top approval for, for the essays. And that apparently happened in the spring of 2012. And this is where, this is where, Quentin Cook's general conference talk later disappointed Travis, and your book talks about this. So we can pick up from there that then leads to the Uchtdorf thing the next year. Yeah, so so Travis gives the presentation, and uh, let me I'm going to find the, the exact reference, but Travis gives the presentation, and he walked in. This is Travis's memory, of course, um, as he explained it to me a couple of years ago. But when he walked in, I, I want what was it like, Travis? I mean, this is all new. Um, you're, you're doing, you're an outsider, you're, um, meaning that you don't work for the church, that, uh, you have some data that challenges the church narrative, which is that people leave the faith because they've sinned. They want to party. They had their feelings hurt. I mean, this is what's been going on for decades. And, um, and what's really extraordinary about this is it was always the church leaders telling people why they left. It was never the people themselves telling why they left. And now, now Travis has some data on this. Let's listen to the people. What a novel idea. Listen to them about why they left. And I think, by the way, the church is much, much better about that today than they were, you know, six or seven years ago. But anyway, um, so Travis has got data. And I said, well, what was it like going into the room? He said, oh, I just looked and I had people just glare, glaring at me. And uh, <laughs> he said that um, he remembered that one of the people glaring at him the most was, I guess, head of the CES 
institutes or so, the church education system. And um, just like, what are we doing here? And um, so, you know, it was a different response. There were some people who were, who really understood that this was a problem, that people were leaving the church because of the faith crisis issues that the church had generated. And also that, um, that the church had to do something about it. And then there were other people in the room who just didn't take it seriously, including Apostle Cook. And Apostle Cook gave a, um, he gave a general conference sermon um, shortly after Travis had met with them. And it really upset Travis because Elder Cook clearly didn't get what was going on as evidenced by this uh, general conference sermon. And let me just um, read uh, part of his address that I think might be helpful. He said, um, let's see here. Okay, this is Apostle Cook. This would be October of 2012. And he warned Latter-day Saints, Elder Cook, about the dangers of using the internet to research church history. Cook addressed the issue in an LDS General Conference sermon in October of 2012, some six months after receiving a copy of Stratford's presentation. He stated, some have immersed themselves in internet materials that magnify, exaggerate, and in some cases, invent shortcomings of earlier church leaders, further warning that church members could draw incorrect conclusions that affect their testimony. Cook uh, counseled, any who have made these choices can repent and be spiritually renewed. And then this is the first part of the next paragraph that I'll read. Cook's failure to grasp the larger issues of faith crisis frustrated Travis or Stratford. For Latter-day Saints afflicted by doubt, things were not that simple. The Apostles' sermon ignored Delin's data, your data, John, about why Latter-day Saints were leaving the church. It did not address the fact that the church had not been forthcoming about its history. And so um, what's what's frustrating about this for, for both myself as a scholar and also Travis and others who, who, who were studying this sort of thing is that Elder Cook was just completely tone deaf. Here you have this thick presentation of qualitative data. By qualitative, we're talking about written paragraphs. This is who I was. I was an elders quorum president. I was a bishop. I was a this. I was a that. Stake presidents, mission presidents. I was a stake president. I was a mission president. They're reaching all of this stuff. And they go through great detail about why they left. It wasn't just like, you know, fill out this questionnaire. They, they did that too, to, to sort of get a quantitative perspective. But it was the qualitative perspective that really struck me, really bearing their souls. And, um, and I might add that the quantitative came first and then the qualitative. And I think Greg Prince told me that, uh, or maybe it was Travis or both, that they... Um, Actually, it was the LDS professor. He said, if you really want to strike a chord with the brethren, get their testimonies. Make it qualitative in addition to quantitative. Um, anyway, so that's what they did. And and, um, and by the way, I don't know if Elder uh, Travis will have to correct this, but I don't know. I don't think that Elder Cook was at that meeting. It was just a bunch of it was it was the PR person, Mike Otterson. It was um, a, it was a bunch of other people. I think Mike Otterson had given Travis's presentation to um, the apostles. El the, re the results, the 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 yes. packet that we created. Yes, I don't delivered to Cook and when, when he went to Salt Lake City, though, I don't think, and I'll right. stand corrected, but I don't think that the two apostles were in that meeting. They were. It was Mike Otterson, the church PR guy. It was the institute guy. It was like you said, church bureaucratic heads who were there. But the apostles were not there, as I recall. And so Mike Otterson is the person who delivered the presentation um, to the two apostles. And Elder Perry and Elder Cook were over the church public relations department at the time. And that's what was their connection was. And I will say that um, after that presentation, Greg Prince himself had delivered um, one of the surveys to the apostles working his personal connections. And so um, they did have access to this. And this leads us to, if I can jump ahead now to Dieter Uchtdorf. Um, so Travis had worked it out with Uchtdorf's secretary. Uh, Travis was going to be in Salt Lake for something. This is the, this summer. Was the following summer, right? 
Yep. The following summer. So this would have been, I think, August of 2013. Maybe it was September, but I think it was yeah. August. And um, anyway, so Uchtdorf was supposed to be there and receive Travis's um, this this uh, this other survey, this qualitative survey directly. I mean, when I say quality, it's huge. It's a massive, massive file. And just to just to add a tiny bit, so between the quantitative study and what became the qualitative study, it was basically Travis and Greg saying the quantitative data wasn't enough. We need the qualitative. Right. But Travis's gift, one of his many gifts, is he's such an incredible graphic designer. So he puts together this bound, yes. beautifully graphically designed set of charts with all these qualitative. It's like this gorgeous tome of rich visual and you know inspiring emotional data. Travis spent years working on this. And so it was a year after the Salt Lake City, the first Salt Lake City meetings, maybe a year and a half, where Travis that summer before Uchtdorf's famous talk has this this uh new bound sort of second study enhanced personally delivered to Dieter Uchtdorf that summer of 2013, correct? Yeah, well said because it is a beautifully I mean he is a graphic designer and the PowerPoint, he shared the PowerPoint that he uh, had given to the church heads, and that was beautifully done, too. And then he created this, this massive document that was so well done. It's the LDS professor and also Greg Prince had participated in this. Um, anyway, so, so um, some of the other apostles, uh, Perry and um, Cook had a version of it but he had further refined the draft that he gave to Dieter Uchtdorf. And uh, so it, it was really all shiny and polished. It was, it was really a nice work of piece of work. Anyway, so Travis had uh, worked with Uchtdorf's uh, secretary to deliver personally at church headquarters, a copy to Uchtdorf. And Uchtdorf was supposed to be there to meet with them. Well, it turns out that Uchtdorf wasn't there. I don't know if he was sick or I think he was, had to be out of town for a, a church assignment the last minute or something. But anyway, um, Travis had delivered a copy of the survey to Uchtdorf's secretary, and she said, I'll make sure that he gets it. And this was, this is October, I think, of 2013. Might have been September. Um, but here's the important point about this. Dieter Uchtdorf, who's long known to be the most open and liberal of the general authorities, he doesn't follow a tri traditional general authority path. He's not from Idaho or Utah. He's not from the Intermountain West. He is from Germany. And uh, Uchtdorf gave this extremely controversial address in October of 2013 at General Conference. I like to say that it's the equivalent of what Marlon Jensen did in January of 2012 at Utah State. That is, he's revealing things um, that some of the brethren don't want revealed. Only the difference is Marlon did his in private, whereas uh, Uchtdorf is doing his in public to the church body. And What's um, I'm going to read part of it because I, I really, if that's okay, John, I think it's so important Please. his words right. And do you have any indication whether Uchtdorf got this approved, whether all the brethren were on board with him giving this talk? Because uh, you get a sense that he got in trouble for this talk uh, at some uh, point, hang, right? Hang tight on that. What's will, that? Say, oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. I'll address that in just a sec, yeah, because okay. I do have an insight into that. Um, let's see here. So Uchtdorf, um, October of 2013. He gives this um, controversial general conference talk. And um, this is really interesting. So he says that, so I'll just read it. In a landmark October 2013 LDS conference address, Uchtdorf admitted that, quote, there have been some things said and done by LDS leaders that could cause people to question, end quote. He further confessed, quote, and to be perfectly frank, there have been times when members or leaders in the church have simply made mistakes. There may have been things said or done that were not in harmony with our values, principles, or doctrine, end quote. Uchtdorf also rejected the notion that Latter-day Saints leave the church because, quote, they have been offended and are lazy or sinful. Actually, it is not that simple. There is not just one reason that applies to the variety of situations, end quote. Although Uchtdorf did not name a specific doctrine or teaching when church leaders may have erred, 
his remarks revealed an intuitive awareness that controversial LDS teachings were pushing mem many members away from the church they had once loved. And that's his phrase, the church they had once loved. Uchtdorf's concerns were well-founded. According to statistical reports, church growth was 1.7% in 2015, the lowest since 1937. By comparison, in 1979, the year following the Black Priesthood Revelation, the growth rate stood at 6.7%. So Uchtdorf goes on record uh, in front of the church body, and he said that we, my colleagues and I, have taught things that have caused people to question. I mean, I cannot emphasize how what a what a, an important comment that is. What a controversial comment that is, because the brethren don't lead people astray. And now Uchtdorf is saying, "Yeah, we do." And um, so, and he also said something that's interesting. He pushed back against the traditional narrative that people leave because they sin, they're lazy, they don't want to go to church, and all that stuff. He's saying, "Don't say that. That's not true." Well, Travis is survey has convinced him that that's not true. He's seen the data and, and bless him for, for speaking uh, truth to the data. So, so he, he acknowledges this in October, 2013. And in December of 2013, I, I have a personal uh, experience with this. I happened to be in Salt Lake on a research trip and I had an appointment with uh, Mike Otterson of the, who was at the time the head of the church's PR department, uh, really a nice guy, really enjoyed Geez, I was with them for two or three hours, it seems like. It was a long time. And um, the purpose of that meeting was I was doing a book at the time on uh, Blacks and Mormons, um, the first book. I'm doing a second book on Blacks and Mormons now, a much different book. But anyway, I was doing a book on Blacks and Mormons, and <laughs> I was uh, writing about Mormon doctrine, Elder McConkie's uh, best-selling work. And the church newspapers had said that, more, uh, I should say, the Desert News had said that Mormon doctrine went out of print in 2010 because of low book sales. I knew that wasn't true. That was a load of malarkey. And oh, um, why did it? Why did it go out of print? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not not permitted to say on record here. Okay. Um, I wish I could. No, that's but, a good answer. I uh, yes, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you as much as I can tell you. There, there's a lot to the story that I'm not at liberty to say. Um. Anyway, so. Uh, I went to him and I, I had the Desert News article and I said, I said, Mike, I'm not here to beat the church up or, I, I, you know, but you and I both know this is this is nonsense. This is complete nonsense. It's the best selling book. It, it was it has been for decades and it still is today. You know that. And I know that. I think you have 40 printings in, in your book that it's that it went through 40 printings. Is that yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it's an it, yes. And um, he looks at me. This is what he does. He goes like this. He goes. Oh, I wish we wouldn't have said that. Meaning the Desert News, it went out of print because of low sales. I wish we wouldn't have said that. And I said, look, I'm not here. Again, I'm a, I'm a scholar. I'm not, I don't do gotcha stuff. That's just garbage. I don't care for that stuff. I just need a statement that the church can give me that I can quote that, that says why it went out of print. I'll even write the statement. And um, when I get back to Colorado, I'll write the statement. And he said, well, that, okay, that's good. That's good. And, uh, what I'll say is that it went out of print because it no longer represents the values of the church. And it was produced, you know, 50 years ago when uh, the time was different or something like that. Um, but just no longer represents the church value, something innocuous. He said, that, that'd be good. That'd be good. So I went back to Colorado. Oh, and he said that, oh, by the way, it'll take a while. When you send me the statement, it'll take a while because it's got to get approved by the brother. It's got to go up through the 12 and the first presidency. I said, that's fine. Whatever it takes. So I went back to Colorado and I wrote a two paragraph statement about why it went out of print. And uh, sure enough, two months later, he wrote back to me and he said, the brethren have approved this. And I think they fixed one sentence or something. And um, th that was the reason why I met with him. But there's more to that story. So I'm trying to get permission to tell more to the story for my next book. So stay tuned. But anyway, um, we had a long discussion about a lot of things and um, he was very gracious. And I asked him, I said, this is December 2013, two months after Uchtdorf's controversial talk. And I said, what did Uchtdorf mean? What did President Uchtdorf mean when he said that, that the brethren have said things that may have caused people to question? And he looked at me and he thought for a couple of seconds and he said, you know, uh, I get asked that often. Let's, let's ask. 
He turns around in his chair and he hits speed dial and calls up Uchtdorf. And in this, you know, thick German accent, I could I could hear everything. You know, I'm right there, not too far away. And he said, um, I've been getting asked a lot. This is Mike Artisan, the head of the church PR, talking to the second council in the first presidency. He said, I get asked a lot about um, what you meant that the brethren have said things that may have caused people to question. What did you mean? And Uchtdorf paused on the phone for a second. And he said, he said, it means whatever Latter-day Saints want it to mean. So he didn't give anything specific about whether it was polygamy or blacks in the priesthood. He didn't say any about that. He just wanted to go on record saying, we're aware. And uh, so Otterson hangs up the phone. He turns to me and said, oh, you heard it all. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> so This is so, a nothing burger. It's a big, fat nothing burger. <laughs> big, fat nothing burger. But I heard later on through the grapevine that Uchtdorf got in trouble for that talk. That um, he, you know, he's acknowledging stuff that they don't, that some of the leaders don't want to acknowledge. And it was Elder Packer who, who got after him. And uh, I, I can't, I want to, I just can't emphasize this enough. I've been studying the apostles and the prophets and their writings, their correspondence, their diaries, their journals, their meeting minutes, their memos. I've seen a lot of stuff. And one of the things that I always, always emphasize when I talk to Latter-day Saints or even scholars or just lay Latter-day Saints, lay persons, which is the brethren are not always a monolith. Don't think that they are. It's like saying that the founding fathers all are all this way. They're all religious or they're all atheists. You sort of see none of that's true. The truth is, is that some of them, none of them were atheists, but some of them were not really religious believers and some of them were. And you, you get the, the same sense here with the, the uh, apostles, that some of them have vastly different opinions about a, a, an array of topics. And I know that shouldn't sound any, you know startling to people because we all have different views. We're human beings. But we, we tend, to, tend to put the brethren on this pedestal that somehow they're all on the same page. And that's complete nonsense. And, um, and so with Elder Packer, I know that he didn't like uh, Dieter Uchtdorf's acknowledgement. He just didn't like it at all. And I could speculate maybe there are others who didn't like it. But I'm certain that there were others who said, yes, that needed to be said. And um, so they bring their personality differences uh, to bear on these kinds of things. There's a quick question. Is this why Uchtdorf isn't in the first presidency from Jamie? Do you have any speculation on that or, or data? Because, because I mean, my narrative would be that Uchtdorf got in trouble for sticking his neck out for people in faith crisis. And that ultimately, along with whatever dynamics, led to him being demoted, disinvited from the first presidency when Russell M. Nelson took over from Thomas S. Monson. And we really haven't heard a lot from him since. He's kind of been, it feels like he's kind of been silenced in the quorum, so to speak. Yeah, so I don't I don't have any direct evidence I can speculate. So this is just, take it for what it's worth, it's pure speculation. But but keep in mind that um, Uchtdorf is is um, he's cut from a different cloth. He's 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 he didn't grow up in Utah culture, or Idaho Mormon culture, and so he th sees things differently. And for a lot of Latter Day Saints, that's that's great, right? You you welcome that sort of openness. He's like the Hubie Brown of our time in terms of being open and, and more tolerant of uh, perhaps some things in the church that other of the brethren aren't tolerant of. And um, so here's my speculation that um, this talk got him in trouble. There's no doubt about it, that Elder Packer was upset. But also, Elder Packer had said some things, and I don't want to go off on a big tangent here, but Elder Packer had said some things about our gay brothers and sisters in general conference that I know you know, John, uh, a lot about, and some of your listeners do, that he said that um, a loving God would never make somebody that way. Well, obviously, people going through, you know, coming out of the closet or dealing with their sexuality and how painful that could be, growing up in an Orthodox Mormon home that, that teaches that, you know, uh, that being heteronormative is the, the way to go. Um, that's a challenge. And so when he says a loving God would never make someone this way, I mean, that's, that's hurtful. And I'm told that after that address was over, that um, President Uchtdorf had given some uh, visited state conferences and regional conferences and basically gave a different narrative. And it got back to Packer and he was really upset about it. And also, by the way, the brethren um, 
had taken some of the most controversial parts of Packer's conference sermon um, out about that a loving God would never make you that way. And so clearly it wasn't just Uchtdorf behind this. And what was interesting, here's me being read between the lines here. So take it for what it's worth. But I remember looking at uh, Uchtdorf. Um, he he uh, made a special trip to BYU to look at the, to go to the museum there, the Bean Museum on the lovely museum on the BYU campus. And um, I don't know if Elder Packer's paintings uh, were there permanently or just on an exhibit. I'm not sure, but they were there. And the church news, I think, had published something about Elder Uchtdorf and his wife going there to visit Brother Packer's paintings. And I, I sort of read that as, ah, oh, he's trying to make it right. And um, it's the same thing that happened at Dallin Oaks, you know, years ago when Oaks and Packer had a very high profile dust up in the 1990s um, over an issue. I mean, when I say high profile, I'm talking about made the Washington Post. Uh, Oaks called... Um, Packer a grizzly bear. He said, you can't stage manage a grizzly bear. And uh, that created a lot of controversy. And um, anyway, uh, later on, you see Elder Oaks pushing the wheelchair of Elder Packer like they're, you know, chums from, from you know, years past. So, but there is a, I mean, the Quorum of the Twelve, as the Dr. Cummins talks about, it's predicated upon unanimity. It's predicated upon cordiality and they have to get along. Otherwise the whole purpose of the quorum doesn't function well and disagreeing and not getting along are, of course are two different things. And there are intense moments with Oaks and Packer and also Uchtdorf and Packer where they weren't getting along. And so my speculation is, is that um, Russell Nelson and Dallin Oaks, they just, well, not, well, I say Dallin Oaks cause he's a significant power player in the, in the leadership today. But they dropped him because um, he was he was outspoken and he wasn't. I don't know if he always followed the party line. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's a bummer. And so shout out to Uchtdorf. I know he's a listener. I'm just kidding. I have no idea if he's a listener. But shout out to Uchtdorf and Marlon Jensen and everyone else uh, for their courage. And Travis Stratford, again, for spearheading so much of this. So Uchtdorf gives that talk and then, and then the essays come out, right? In, in what, what month did the first essay drop? December. December of night of 2013, right? Yeah. Quick story about that. Okay. I don't think it's in my book. Um, I don't think, but the story is it, the first essay dropped on late on a Friday afternoon by design. And in the, of course, the, 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 the um, in the journalist world, if you want to get minimum exposure to something, drop it on a Friday afternoon when people are going into the weekend. And um, a couple of my contacts who worked on the essays told me that that was by design, that it was, um, it was, let me get this straight. Who I think it was President Monson. I think it went all the way up to the top that President Monson is the one that wanted it dropped on a Friday afternoon. That is released so that it might somehow miss the purview of some of the national news outlets. That's so funny. Let's let's now go back and follow a different thread, which is the how the essays got created. Do you mind even going back to the original authors and then tracing kind of the committee process? What can you tell us about how the essays were created, who created them, and uh, you know what what led to their release, and then what the rollout strategy was, which you just it, it sort of in, uh, you know made a reference to, but in your book you go into more detail about how explicitly um, you know soft soft release they wanted the essays to be. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So so going back to um, again the the. Swedish rescue fire side where it was first acknowledged that there are questions and they are coming. And this is the first time the church is going to try to put together something systematically about these difficult issues. Whereas before it was BYU professors or maybe teachers in the church education system who were sort of doing this on their own publishing with desert book, for example. Now, now this is a church effort and it goes to the, the highest echelons of church leadership they'll be signed off by the first presidency themselves. And so what they did was they, um, they decided they wanted to have scholars, uh, typically people with PhDs, who would take the first stab at the draft process. 
And many of these essays were really, really long. I mean, I'm talking about 30, 40 pages. They were very detailed. And they didn't know um, what would be the most helpful. And so they asked scholars, and I can talk about some of the scholars in just a moment who, who produced them, but um, they wrote these lengthy pieces. And so the scholars took the first stab at it. And then it went to the next layer, which would be historians in-house, that is on the church payroll. And then once they scrubbed it and edited it, and then it went up to um, the apostles. And some of the apostles had a larger or more significant role than others. Um, Quentin L. Cook, for example, uh, one of my contacts told me, quote, had a very sharp pencil. Nice way of saying that he was very active in the editing process. And then it went up to the first presidency themselves. So it was a very elaborate process. And it's similar to the Joseph Smith papers. Those are signed off, these, these wonderful primary source documents that um, the church historians have been producing over the last several years, this multi-volume uh, collection of the prophet Joseph Smith. Anyway, um, the brethren sign off on those too. So nothing is going out without their, their input. And the, the question they had was, what would be the best format to release them? And also how long should they be? And I know that some of the essays, they had, I think, three tiers to them. The longer pieces, shorter pieces, and really short pieces. And in the end, they chose to go with the shorter pieces, thinking that Latter-day Saints would not read some 40-page you know, document full of footnotes. And so, um, but that was, a, that was a struggle, because what's the point of producing them unless you can, they're readable to the public? The next point is, how do we release them? Knowing that the church is now acknowledging things that they had once not acknowledged or they had significantly downplayed. We don't want to make more trouble for ourselves. We don't want to uh, cause a faith crisis. So this is why you don't see them released in general conference or talked about in general conference. This is why you don't see them, you know, broadcast all over the church news or the ensign. Um, now, that's a little bit different today. I want to be clear on that. But initially, I'm talking about when they first came out. They really wanted to hide them. They didn't want them known to the church body. They wanted them, as one of my contacts put it, they wanted them four clicks away on the internet. And the purpose of that was that if somebody uh, was having a faith crisis and they went to their bishop, they could say, Bishop, I've read all of the stuff on the internet and the church is hiding its history. And the bishop could say, no, that's not true. Let's go to LDS.org. And it's right there. That, that was the initial intention. And you have a term for that. Tell us the term you use. <laughs> well, this isn't my term, but it was somebody coined the term plausible deniability. So um, uh, anyway, so they, the problem with that, that, that strategy was the bishops didn't know about it. And again, we're talking about in the early years of the release. We're not talking about years later because it's much different today. And some of the apostles have talked about these, these essays. Well, anyway, it was, it was, as Elder Snow put it, it was a soft rollout. And they recognized right away that there were problems with this so-called soft rollout because um, some, you know, inquisitive Latter-day Saints who keep their ears to the ground had discovered them. And uh, they had started to teach from them in their Sunday school lessons. And there was a story told, uh, Peggy Fletcher Stack, I think it was Peggy's, in the Salt Lake Tribune, she did an essay or a story on a, um, a Latter-day Saint in Hawaii who was teaching his youth Sunday school class. I'm not sure what the lesson was, but he appealed to the, the race and priesthood essay. As I recall, he was in a biracial marriage. And um, so those issues were important to him. And he had appealed to this document in his class. And it got back to the bishop. And the bishop released him for teaching from unauthorized sources, the Salt Lake Tribune noted. And of course, this is crazy because this is on the LDS Church website. And so nobody knew about these essays. And uh, there were a couple of circular, I, I talk about this in the book, but there were a couple of just, uh, you know, uh, private circular uh, letters to um, some of the priesthood leaders throughout Utah and Idaho about the letters. But for the most part, they were largely unknown to the church body. And, and so finally, after stories started leaking that... Um, that people were teaching from them, these unauthorized sources. And also, too, the story leaked at BYU, for example, when some of the professors talked about the essays, um, some of the students were talking about, oh, these are just PR releases from the church. Well, these aren't PR releases. 
This is signed off by the first presidency themselves. So to call it a PR release really undermines, you know, what this is about. So the church recognized that they were in a, they were in a lurch. They had to really address this issue. And this is where you get Elder Ballard. Um, ah, don't quote me on the time. It's in the book. But I think it's 2017. He gave a, a church-wide fireside to the young adults of the church in the church education system. And he, he basically said that, um, he said, uh, teachers in the CES system, so teachers and students, you should know these essays like the back of your hands. Gone are the days where we can tell people, don't worry about your faith concerns. Put them on the shelf. I hate that metaphor. Put them on the shelf and forget about them. Move forward. And so um, Elder Ballard said something instructive, you know, know them like the back of your hands. And then after that address, they started to work uh, the church essays into some of the curriculum of the church and also into the four volume saint series. They, they make references to the gospel topics essays there. And so really the strategy is, is they still haven't talked about them in general conference as far as I know, um, or, or the enzyme. And if, if, if that's true and I missed it, then somebody please let me know. Um, but the strategy is let's talk about them slowly and slowly work them in to our curriculum. And that, that'll, that'll be the equivalent of that 50 year old learning for the first time on the internet that, um, the prophet used a, a seer stone as he in a hat as he, as he translated the book of Mormon, we're going to just sort of, uh, bring them into the story. And that's the, that's what they've been doing. And I know that they use them at, I know for a fact, they use them at, um, in the BYU religion department. A number of some of my friends who teach there um, are very active in promoting these essays there. So, um, so the question is, people ask, um, who are the scholars? And I don't think this is a secret. I'm not divulging anything that's secret about any of this stuff. Um, I didn't put this in the book for for a reason. I think it's important um, to know why I didn't put the, the the names of the scholars in the book. And the reason is is um, and Newell, my co-editor, we, we're on the same page with this, is that we wanted people to focus on the essence of the essays and not get hung up with who wrote them. I think that is really, really important. Is um, And so, um, and also too, it was done by committee, really. I mean, the scholars that I'll, I'll mention in just a moment, they took the first stab at this, but it was done by a committee. And it was done by Latter-day Saints whom the church historians and the general authorities thought could assist them in this process. People who were outspoken, who had written themselves about these various topics. And so that's why you don't see authors attached, because it really was done by committee. Um, anyway, so um, Terrell Givens had, a, had a, played a role in some of these essays. I'm not, he's, his, the exact one that he wrote, I'm not quite sure about. I think it was Becoming Like God, but I'm not 100% certain on him. Uh, Book of Mormon and DNA Studies, Ugo Prego, who wrote a lot, who still writes a lot about Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon DNA. Also, Matt McBride from the Church Historian's Office participated. Uh, McBride also um, worked on the Book of Mormon translation. Steve Harper, BYU scholar, um, who just published a book on the first vision. He wrote the first vision accounts, acknowledging that there were multiple first vision accounts. Um, Patrick, let's see, Patrick Mason wrote the essay on peace and violence among 19th century Latter-day Saints. And uh, Patrick has done lots of great work on um, violence from the 19th century. And clearly he was a good person for that role. Um, there were three polygamy essays, Plural Marriage in Kirtland and Nauvoo. Um, Brian Hales, who wrote, who's written a number of books on uh, Mormon polygamy from an apologetic perspective. So um, Brian was... Um, person to write here. Brian, I might add parenthetically, um, is the only person on this list that I could see who is not trained as an historian. It doesn't diminish whatever one thinks of his work. I want to be clear on that. But he's certainly been prodigious in producing a number of books on uh, polygamy, and I know he's working on other projects, but he's a um, medical doctor by profession, and he's been very involved in the Mormon scholarly community, and heck of a nice guy, too. Um, plural marriage and families in early Utah, uh, BYU professor, retired BYU professor, Catherine Danes, who, who wrote a book on polygamy during that time period. Um, the manifesto on the end of plural marriage was written by the, um, Richard Bushman chair of Mormon history at university of Virginia, a scholar named Kathleen Flake, 
who has written on plural marriage in the early 19th century and done, done some remarkable scholarship. Race and the Priesthood essay written by my friend Paul Reeve. Um, again, these are first drafts, so it's not it's not fair to say that what was eventually published looks like the first draft they turned in, because that's just not the case. It, it had gone through several different iterations from various people. So I want to be clear on that. Um, but nonetheless, these folks took the first stab at it. So Paul Reeve did Race and the Priesthood, and Paul did a wonderful book uh, talking about Mormons and race from the 19th century that uh, had deservedly won the Mormon History Association Best Book Award a few years back. Um, Jed Woodworth of the Church History Department, um, he wrote the one on translation and historicity of the Book of Abraham. And he was also um, a person who assisted with uh, Richard Bushman's book on rough stone rolling that was published uh, on, on the prophet Joseph Smith that was published in 2005. And then the essays on mother in heaven and Joseph Smith's teachings about priesthood, temple, and women were both written by um, two women, two scholars who work for the church history department, Lisa Olf Olson Tate and Jenny Reeder. And um, um, so this is nothing secretive here. I don't know why sometimes we talk about it as secretive. It shouldn't be a secret. But anyway, Elder Stowe had shared these names with me. I knew most of them already, but um, I guess I didn't ask about the Are Mormons Christians one. I'm not sure who wrote that one and Becoming Like God. I know that um, Terrell Givens wrote at least one of those. But anyway, the other ones, um, Elder Snow had filled in for me. And um, so if I got them wrong, I'm going to blame it on him. <laughs> so we've got a couple questions about, thank you for giving those names. I don't know that those have ever been shared publicly all in one place. A couple a couple comments, questions. Uh, my, my good friend Samuel Pinson writes, and I'm going to read a couple questions, comments, and then have you respond. Samuel asks, doesn't the lack of attribution on the essays allow plausible deniability for current and future church leaders. And then Kimberly, my dear friend Kimberly writes, John, could you ask Matt's opinion on why none of the gospel topic essays are attributed? So, um, and there's also no date. So there's no date on them. There, There's no attribution. Uh, you know, why? Why did they choose that, that approach? Well, the first one is it's done by committee. So I think, again, I mean, who would be the author? Um, so I, I think I, I could be wrong on this, but I've talked to a number of church history employees about this. Um, I think the idea was that it was done by committee, truly was done by a committee. And so to put somebody's name down it would be just not, it just wouldn't be right. And you certainly can't put done by committee, right, <laughs> of 17 people. Um, and I think that now people have, Elder Snow has been very vocal about this. He, he, he's publicly acknowledged that, that scholars participated. And let me just say something too, is with the race and the priesthood essay, it wasn't just Paul Reeve who produced the first draft, but they reached out to Patrick Mason. And I think Patrick, um, uh, and Armin Moss, my good friend, Armin Moss, the late Armin Moss, um, I think it was Patrick that said one of the critiques that he made was, hey, look, this isn't just a, a priesthood ban. This is a temple ban, too. And um, and so you you see that in the final draft of the essay. It's not just a priesthood ban. Black women are affected by this, too. They can't go to the temple. And I think that was Patrick, one of Patrick's contributions. And that's 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 enormous. That's significant. And then Armin weighed in. And also, of course, my my friend uh, Darius Gray also um Wait in. So they did reach out to people um, in the preliminary process, and then it worked up its way up the chain. And um, I'll share a, a quick story. Well, let me answer the question. I, I have another story I want to share about this. Uh, so that's why they didn't do it, because so many people participated in this process. And the reason why they didn't put a date on it, because it was kind of anticipated all along that they would be revising the, these essays. And I haven't taken the time to follow these essays, you know, day by day. Oh, they made a change today. I know some people do that. They've got far more time on their hands than I do. <laughs> um, but, but one of the things I noted in the book is that, um, that Newell and I noted in the book was that, that these essays would be revised and that the, the essays that, that, that Newell and I and our scholars were critiquing were the essays that were originally published in 2013. And it was important to know that because I don't want someone to go back five years from now, wait a minute, look at the essay online and look at what you wrote. 
Well, the chances that that essays evolved. I don't know how many times they've evolved or been added to or even detracted from since they were first published. Um, but I, I know that they have been changed, including the one that I've worked on, Race and the Priesthood. So that's why they left the date out, because it was it was commonly understood that, that these essays would evolve and would be added to. So I hope that that answers the question. Oh, you're on. You're Kimberly right. gives a follow-up comment. She says it would be lovely if the First Presidency or Quorum of the Fifteen could sign off on them like they do the proclamations. And thanks, Kimberly, for that. And I'll just add, one of the things, you know, you mentioned some of the things that were super frustrating. One was that no one knew about these things. So, like, I'm getting excommunicated, you know, literally by 2014, 2015, I'm telling my stake president and bishop these things that I've known forever they're like, I've never heard of this stuff. You're getting these from anti-Mormon resources. And I'm like, no, I'm getting this from the church's own website. But they had never read the essays. Not only had they never read the essays, they didn't even know the essays existed. And this was a big problem for a lot of people. Their decision to make this soft launch really hurt a lot of people during a time where they were really going after excommunicating Jeremy Reynolds, excommunicating Sam Young, Bill Real, me, Kate Kelly. All these excommunications were happening, and the church didn't even bother to inform and educate their own lay leadership about the essays that, that they themselves were putting out. That was really frustrating. But then also, I, I, I know so many people that, like, they were going through a faith crisis, so their parents are like, where are you learning this stuff? You're getting it from anti-Mormon sources. They would, you know, these people would share the essays with their own parents and the parents would say, oh, no, the the, S, the church website must have been hacked because none of that stuff's true. And so those are those essays must be fake or hacked or. And so, like, if the church had been willing to sign them and if they would still, that would make it just a lot easier, let, let alone talk about it in general conference, that there's something I feel like unfortunate and or slimy slash disingenuous about just not not you know broadcasting with the bullhorn all throughout the church that these essays exist now ballard gave his talk i think that was at some fireside somewhere but we really do need them to be signed off and for there to be general conference talks given and this stuff let known in the end sign or now it's called the liahona whatever it is because it, to this day, I bet this stuff has only penetrated 5% of the church's consciousness. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yes. I think it depends on where you are, of course, in the church. It depends on where you live. I know um, that I have uh, some friends in Salt Lake who went to their bishop and they said, hey, look, these are really important. And can, can I give a fireside on these? And the, they're, they're approved by the church. And... Um, this uh, this friend of mine, the bishop or the stake, actually went all the way up to the stake president. He said yes, and so they covered each of the thirteen essays over a period of thirteen weeks, and so over a year it took them to get through this. But my friend, who's sort of a quasi gospel scholar, he's not an academic, but he he's certainly involved in the Mormon scholarly world as a book publisher. And um, anyway, so his stake president had given him permission to do this, whereas um, my mother in her ward in Atlanta, Georgia, where she lives, I said, she knows about these essays because of me. But I said, um, did you know about them before we talked about them? And she said, no. And she said, do you think anybody in your Atlanta ward knows about them? And she said, no. The people who know about them, read them about them online on the internet. And uh, because they're not talked about. And again, the whole idea is they, they want to avoid a faith crisis. And so if they can work this in slowly into the curriculum, then it's not an issue anymore. And that, that just takes time. But I also want to say from talking to some of the good people who put these together, this is they're waiting into uncharted territory. There's no blueprint for any of this stuff. And I know it's easy for me and for you and maybe listeners to say, ah, they should sign their names and they should do this and take a bullhorn and broadcast it. Um, but from their perspective, uh, they have to go uh, slowly. And they're learning as they go, especially as they're reading in the Salt Lake Tribune about some dude in Hawaii who gets released for teaching from church approved pieces or BYU, a story in the local Salt Lake Tribune that uh, these are PR pieces. Well, that's complete nonsense. They're not PR pieces. This is a very uh, um, thought out and engaged process by many people over many months who are trying to do the right thing, however inept they may be at times. And, um, 
And so here's a quick story about about how really this speaks to this issue that they just don't want this stuff out because of the faith crisis issues. And uh, one of my friends um, was talking to Elder Cook one day, Apostle Cook, and um, he was upset that one of the essays that he cared about was this needs to be broadcast. Let's can you can you give a sermon in general conference, Elder Cook? Can one of you or the brethren talk about this in general conference? And uh, Elder Cook looked at him. They're in a meeting. Elder Cook looked at him and he said, we have gone about as far as we can go. That's an exact quote. We have gone about as far as we can go. And what he meant by that was there are people in the quorum who do not support the release of these essays. There, um, there are some of us who do and some of us who don't. And uh, it's that, again, speaking to that idea that they have different views. And um, some take the view that just go full enchilada, release them all, broadcast them from the top of the temple in Salt Lake and let people know about them. That'll be helpful. And others, no way. And um, and I might add, you know, again, listeners can disagree or shake their heads at this, but um, their, their, their fears are well-founded. There are tons of Latter-day Saints who have left the, the church over these essays, not just in the United States, but around the world. Just a, a personal story. Never forget it. I was, <laughs> I was at the, uh, I was at the uh, tire place like I don't know four years ago or something, and uh, getting my car worked on. And I'm just waiting. I had like an hour to kill. I'm just really reading Sports Illustrated online, you know, as I'm waiting for my car. My former brother-in-law, who's from Peru, calls me, and I say, "Former, my, my sister and he had been divorced for a number of years at that point." And he reaches out to me and he said, "Matt," in his very thick Peruvian accent. Matt, have you heard of these gospel topics essays? I said, I, he didn't know that I was doing a book, you know, at that very moment. I mean, <laughs> and I said, yeah, I've heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I just came across them and I'm just astonished. I, I'm having this faith crisis. That's the word he used. I'm having a faith crisis. And this is a guy, by the way, who's on the high council in, in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm having this faith crisis. And, uh, and I just, you know, I listened. I said, well, what's going on? And um, anyway, so he went through some of the issues. He said, I've been teaching these things my entire life about blacks, about polygamy, about this, about that. And now I'm being told that that wasn't right. This bothers me. And so my, my former brother-in-law, um, nice guy, he, among a lot of Latter-day Saints, have had these issues. And um, I, I should say that I've had people send me stuff that I don't normally go fishing or surfing the internet for this stuff, but I had a, a relative of mine who, um, I, I don't know, I hadn't talked to this relative in a long time, but she sent me a link and she said, have you heard about this guy here? It was a BYU Idaho student, you know, and he went through very this very lengthy and, and detailed and, and really eloquent post that he made on some website about how the, he came across the uh, gospel topics essays and he didn't know they were church approved. So he went on this mission to disprove the writers. And I don't know who he thought wrote them, <laughs> but he went on this mission to prove that whatever they said in these essays were wrong, that Joseph Smith didn't use a seer stone. And uh, anyway, as he got further into the research, he said, I just, I just exploded. I couldn't, I realized that these essays were right. And he ended up leaving the church. That was the purpose of the post. So the brethren, I mean, they had every right to be concerned. And I don't have any good data for anybody to, uh, to share with anybody. And I doubt the church does either about how the gospel topics essays have forced people out of the church. But I would argue um, maybe Jana Reese, who's done some wonderful work with disaffection and some of the things that she's done recently. Maybe she might uh, explore this topic. But um, I, I wonder if the people that, that struggle with these essays, you know, sort of like the, the bullseye narrative, the people at the bullseye here are the most orthodox, the most, I don't want to use the word conservative, but the most orthodox faithful Latter-day Saints. And then you get maybe liberal progressive types who are a little bit on the outskirts of the ring a little bit. They're not off the, the, bulls or the, the, the bullseye yet, or the dartboard, if you will, but they're on the outer parts of the ring. And, um, and then they come across these, these faith crises, these LDS gospel topics essays, and that's what makes them jump off the, the cliff, if you will, figuratively speaking. Whereas the people in the middle of the ring it doesn't make them jump off the cliff, but it makes them move a few inches or a few feet to the right or to the left. And um, and that's, I think, a good way to think about how the church does these things 
is that they're really trying to protect those people right in the middle, the bullseye. The people on the outskirts, whatever pulls them to the outskirts, whether it's LBTQ issues, whether it's whatever it is, um, they're, in my opinion, they're less concerned about those folks, and more concerned about keeping the Orthodox right there in that comfortable center. Yeah. And I can just say that over the past five years, I once a month, I've traveled to a different city to hold a faith crisis workshop or retreat. I've been doing this for five, six years now. And every time I hold a workshop or retreat, you know, we'll have 30 to 70 people there. And at the beginning of the retreat, I go around the room and ask everybody, what caused your crisis of faith? And inevitably, it's always Mormon Stories podcast or CES letter or Rough Stone Rolling. Um, Rough Stone and, Rolling. Oh, yeah, for sure. That That is always one of the ones that's mentioned. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mormon think a little bit. Sometimes it's Year of Polygamy by Lindsay Hanson Park. But the Gospel Topics essay is, is definitely in the top three of most mentioned uh, for, for the impetus. And we have listeners right now commenting that are saying they left as a result. So, I mean, it's fair. It's fair that they were afraid to release this. It's so lawyerly because they knew to cover their rear ends morally, ethically, and or even legally, like you said, they had to release these, these essays for plausible deniability so that they could no longer have it be said that they were hiding the information and deceiving people. And at the same time, um, you know, uh, a lot of people couldn't find the essays. I, I have someone, um, someone wrote in, Tyler wrote, I was asked by a friend about the Google Topics essays in 2014 at BYU-Idaho, and I went looking for them and couldn't find them. I had to use a search engine to find the essays on the church's own website. So they made them super hard to find, which which is problematic. But then, yeah, so many people have left, and so it, they, it's sort of a lose-lose. If they deny it and hide it, they lose. But if yeah. they if they publicize it, they lose. And in some ways, it's almost like, uh, you know how the roads to Rome were used against Rome in the end? So the soldiers used it to travel their armies to foreign countries. But then once the foreign countries got stronger, they used the roads to conquer Rome. I think these essays are, are a double-edged sword for the church. They, they allow the church to... No, to 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 uh, shoot down further claims that they're hiding and obscuring the history, but but they're also uh, increasing uh, the number of people leaving, and it it's it continues to uh, to be a significant outgrowth of people leaving the church every year, and now that they're available on, on the on the handheld devices, you know it's becoming more and more problematic for the church. I think I think too though uh, again. Um, I think that that it'll get better over time. I mean, I, I can't imagine ten years from now that someone's going to read these these essays and leave. I mean, if they do leave ten years from now, I would surmise that there are other things going on that would force them out, right? Because ten years from now, this stuff is going to be well worked into the curriculum. And when I say well worked in the curriculum, they're going after BYU students first. Remember that idea that we talked about a minute ago? that if you can keep these kids in the church, get them married in the temple, then there's a good shot that you'll keep them active for life. And um, so they're definitely working these essays into the BYU curriculum in Provo and also I'm sure Hawaii and Idaho. Um, and they're also working them into the curriculum on the Saint series, this, this four volume series that they're working on. And, um, you know, this was really clear to me when I met with Mike Otterson um, in December of 2013, that wonderful three hour interview I had with him. And one of the things that it confirmed to me talking to him is how much uh, the international church dictates what the Salt Lake church does. What I know that might sound strange, but they're not concerned necessarily about, you know, a BYU professor with a PhD who's been in the church for years. And, you know, he's certainly at a different level scholastically or uh, than most Latter-day Saints. They, they really have the lowest common denominator. Um, they're looking at that new convert in Latin America who just joined and they don't know anything. And um, so they want to nurture them and, and lead them along. And I hate to use this metaphor because I just think it's so over, it's trite, but it works because they, they want to really give them um, some milk before they give them the meat. 
And so that's that's the modus operandi. You read their manuals today compared to, say, 50, 60 years ago. The, some of these manuals are quite erudite. They're written by Hugh Nibley. They're written by some BYU professors with some credentials. And now, really, you've got these manuals that were, they're not erudite. They're, again, they're, they're catering to the lowest common denominator. And that's one of the things that Mike Otterson shared with me is we have that new convert in Africa or Latin America in mind. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why they're not going to shout them from the bullhorn. If, from general conference, that um, if you if you give up stand up in general conference and you say, we've got these essays online, you should go read them. I mean, that's going to cause an immediate impact with some of these newer members who have not been far enough along in the faith. Whereas if you work them into the curriculum, into the four volume saint series or at BYU, you've got resources to help you process them. Right. So if you're reading the gospel topics essays in a BYU religion class, you can go to your professor and say, hey, look, what about this? And that professor is there to, you know, massage things and walk you through it and put it in context, perhaps. Um, and the Saint series, you know, that's a carefully controlled environment where they can work this in. So it's fairly um, innocuous. So but you don't get that if you just if you um, shout it out from the rooftops in conference. And I'm certain that that's one of the reasons why they continue to not broadcast these in conference because they don't want these essays to be read in isolation. They want people to have a way to talk about them, a community, if you will, to guide them and lead them along, as opposed to just read them in isolation and then having a crisis and leaving the church. Yeah, and I just need to add two things because I've been following this for a while. One is that the problem with that is informed consent. You get these, you get these African-Americans or Africans that join the church knowing nothing about the church's history with race, only to find out sometimes years into their membership about the church's history. And, you know, that's true about the, the peep stone in the hat. That's true about the DNA in the Book of Mormon. People reach out to me all the time saying, I converted the church. It's this family-friendly organization. The ward embraced me. You know, oh, I just thought everything was great, but they never told me this stuff. I didn't realize I was joining a cult. That's not my words. That's their words. And there's a big problem with this milk before meat thing because it denies an investigator's informed consent to know what they're joining. And that's that's problematic. The only other thing I'll notice is that I was keeping in touch with all these people that Marlon Jensen. So from like the 2010, from the Swedish rescue time period to 2013, Marlon Jensen was like the go-to guy and all these people having faith crisis who, you know, were blue bloods that were connected to the church leadership that could get an audience with the general authority. Marlon Jensen would would go out and meet with them or, or do phone calls with them. And what Marlon Jensen himself concluded was once they've once they've been um, you know, I'll say brainwashed, or once they've been indoctrinated with the the correlated, unsustainable, false uh narrative, and then they find out it's false, they're gone. Marlon Jensen himself would tell people. When I meet with a 40-year-old that was taught the false history, the whitewashed history, I have a 0% success rate in bringing them back to the church. Yeah. And so they made an intentional effort. They basically said, we're going to lose a big chunk of the 30-somethings, the 40-somethings, the 50-somethings, the 60-somethings. And the best we can do, like you just said, is start with them young again. And like you said, inoculate them, which is a weird analogy because it's a germ or a virus that they're actually infecting people with, but to inoculate them with the factual church history. Now they're going to go back to the younger generations with this hope that they can salvage the younger generations because they've acknowledged the 30 somethings onward are pretty much irretrievable. You know, I, I think it, um, so just a, qu a quick thought about uh, what people know and don't know when they get baptized. There's no question. They Who wants to talk about polygamy, right? That was true years ago, and it's true today. That's just such a tough, tough, tough thing to talk about to a person not of the faith, is why the church once had this practice and what it meant. And quite frankly, the church's literature over the years on polygamy has not been good, to be honest. I mean, really, the two worst things, I think, in my opinion, were polygamy and blacks and the priesthood. And the reason is, is because they're just, they're hard to discuss and, and share with people. Um, so nobody's talked about polygamy, really. I mean, you know, section 132, a little bit the Doctrine and Covenants, but some of the more modern lessons even have a little caveat at the very bottom. Don't talk about polygamy. I'm like, what? Or plural marriage. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this revelation. And you're supposed to talk about it. 
or Brigham Young in the manual, you know, a few years ago when they were, the church was going through the teachings of the church presidents and they turned Brigham Young into a monogamist. I mean, that, that's just not sustainable. And I think it, it deal, it's a function of the people who produce these, right? The people who are on the correlation committee and who are tasked with producing these manuals. And I'm convinced that the vast majority of the people on these committees have no background in any of this stuff. And this is where it becomes problematic. And they say stuff that's then controversial and they don't even know it's controversial um, until later after the fact they hear. The, uh, the, the race issue is interesting. Certainly uh, black and biracial people who became members before the priesthood revelation in 1978, they were told about the ban. There's no question about it. They knew there was informed consent there, John. And um, because they wanted to, to let them know, look, you can't you realize that you can't hold the priesthood. And here are the reasons why. And they went through various lineage lessons and all this stuff. Um, but after 1978, there's no question they didn't talk about it. And I, I think the feeling was it was a moot point. If if uh, if blacks were worthy, they'd be treated like anybody else. They could go to the temple and go on missions and all of that stuff. So it's predicated upon worthiness. But the problem is, of course, if you don't talk about it, even after the ban's been lifted, it still is problematic because diligent black and brown Latter-day Saints, they want to know, you know, how does this apply to me? And I know that we'll talk about this when we get to my essay on when I, I critique the race and priesthood essay. So we'll talk about uh, some this in more detail. But they want to know, how does this apply to me? And um, it's it's very much a concern for them, especially when they hear these racial tropes that are continuing to circulate in the 1980s and 1990s about black people being cursed and less valiant. It is hugely problematic. And to a white Latter-day Saint, they can't figure out the problem. I mean, I can't tell you how many white Latter-day Saints I've talked to. Why is that our black brother? Why is he upset? He can hold the priesthood. They just don't get it. Do you realize how offensive it is to think that the church that you love, that you're fully vested in, thinks that your skin, something you're proud of, is the sign of a divine curse? And what's worse, that somehow through your moral probity, your righteousness, that skin, that curse can be lifted and you can figuratively and literally become white again, back to your precursed state. I mean, that's just crazy, crazy talk and um, inoffensive and damaging to one's um, faith. So, so there was discussions about these kinds of things with race before the priesthood revelation and afterwards it was the elephant in the room. And I think I'm going to just pontificate for 30 seconds, if you'll indulge me. I don't normally do this, but I think that, um, who am I to give the church counsel? Whatever. But I think that um, the church has to find a meaningful narrative for people in the 21st century. I mean, um, if, if, you're, if you're just talking about the same stuff you did 30, 40 years ago, that's problematic. You've got to grow. The challenges of today's generation are not the challenges of the generation 30 or 40 years ago. And, um, and what I mean by that is, the church needs to talk about things that are on the, 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 the minds of Latter-day Saints. And it's not a one size fit all. What the Latter-day Saints in South America or the Caribbean or whatever they're thinking about is much, much different than some, you know, say, ward in Brooklyn, New York. And so there has to be flexibility. And I understand they've done some of that. So that's not what I want to where I want to go. I'm talking about uh, addressing social issues that concern people today. These educated people who are leaving the church. For example, race is a great example. We've got Black Lives Matter. We've got um, Oliver Oaks just talked about this recently, uh, which generated a lot of um, comment. We've got um, really some drastic racial differences in both the larger American society and in the church. And to think that we can't talk about it at church is just, I think, this is me being offering my opinion, I think it's reprehensible. You need to have a safe space where you can go to church and worship with your, your fellow congregants and bear each other's burdens right there at church. And in some cases, particularly in branches and wards that have a heavy racial population, a, a, ter a terrific diversity, um, you need to talk about these things. And the church doesn't want to talk about it. It's because it's the elephant in the room because of its own racial past, which I think is unfortunate. You just simply acknowledge it and you apologize for it, and you move on. And I think that it creates a healthy um, atmosphere where people can talk about these challenging issues. And we could say the same thing about LBGTQ issues. If we can't talk about them at church, where can we talk about them? Well, since we don't talk about them at church, LBGTQ or race, 
we're, we're left with these own little communities online, which I don't want to minimize. They're important. But, but really, the church is abdicating a, 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 a space that Latter-day Saints are yearning for, in my opinion. And um, it's not healthy for the church. The church needs to evolve in its the way it looks at its lessons, the way that it allows uh, sacrament talks, where we can bear each other's burdens at church and dealing with uh, issues that are really dividing us today. And I just don't see that happening. And I, it's prob problematic for a number of Latter-day Saints. Oh, you're on mute, John. Really great comment from... Uh... A listener in the UK, Peter Bleakley, writes, The fundamental flaw with the GA's entire softly gradual change approach is that it is too little too late, and they don't have the control or time frame required. The info is all in on the internet, and the church will literally cease to exist functionally within the next 20 years here in the UK and Europe and most other regions. We are down only 15% of our membership in the UK active now and falling fast. The changes need to be radical and fast to save anything in time. And his his uh, comment cuts off. But this is something that I, I have heard in England and Scotland and Sweden and Netherlands and Denmark. The church is in a free fall in Western Europe um, and in Canada and in parts of Asia. And uh, a lot of it has to do with the availability, availability of the Internet. I think I, I think so, um, but the church isn't unique. Western Europe's been in a free fall with organized religion in terms of attendance for a number of years now. There's been lots of studies done on this, and um, the church, our church, is um, they're no different. And I, I can't speak to it comparatively why there are fewer Catholics in Western Europe than today. I do know they're not going to mass as they once did. I, I don't know if it's because they're finding stuff about Catholicism on the internet. I suspect that it, this is a different challenge for Latter-day Saints. And one of the reasons is, is because Latter-day Saints tie their truth claims or we tie our truth claims into our history. And I don't know <laughs> any Protestant or Catholic group that, you know, I know that my Catholic church is true because of Pope Urban IV. Nobody does that. Right. And we, we like to do that as Americans, too. We, we the founding fathers, you know, we what do the founding fathers think about the war in Iraq? Nobody says in England, you know, what does King George the Third say about? I mean, so we we have a tradition in our country of revering our elders, and so the church has tried its truth claims into all of this, and of course, when those truth claims don't, um, when the correlated truth claims that come out into the manuals and into the missionary discussions, when they don't line up with stuff you find on the internet, that creates the crisis, and I, I'm just so I guess I'm just confident enough to think that if if we would just acknowledge more of this stuff openly and candidly and let people talk about it um yeah you might lose some people but it would be far better than the approach today and i get people all the time i get i get african americans who call me all the time they read something i've written or whatever and they they say something like you know i'm having this faith crisis and i simply say to them first of all if you want confirmation from for me, for you to either leave or stay in the church, I'm not your guy, but I can give you some context. And, um, and if we just, I, the first thing I ask him is, are you happy in your ward? Do they treat you well? And if the answer is yes, then I say to them, then whatever I'm about to say shouldn't matter. It, it won't matter if you're happy and you, you find a community. So whatever the history is, it's the history. If you're not happy at your ward, if you find that they're not accepting of your interracial marriage or your biracial kids, or they're somehow racist, why are you staying? Go find another ward. It's that simple. Life is too short to deal with this nonsense. And uh, I just dealt with somebody recently about this in Utah. And I said, you know, leave your Provo ward and go to the Genesis group in Salt Lake. I guarantee you'll find a home there. And um, anyway, so... Uh, we need to acknowledge these things and uh, move forward. But I'm not naive enough to know that some of these things are complex. When we deal with polyandry, one of the lessons here, uh, or the Gospel Topics essays, it deals with polygamy and polyandry, and um, and that's a that's a tough, tough, tough thing to explain. That the prophet um, is proposing to other men's wives while they're away on on church missions. How do you explain that away in some faith promoting way? And that's precisely why they don't want these essays, you know, promoted. 
Um, and they've, you know, they've done a nice, pretty nice job. Um, there's been a couple of scholars in the church um, who talked about, he's trying to understand this through a scholarly lens. And he talks about that the prophet wanted to create, you know, familial relationships that would bind itself for eternity. He wanted to seal himself to the human family. And uh, that's, uh, I mean, whatever one thinks about that claim, it's, it, theologically, it's creative, it's rich, it's interesting. Um, and it certainly contradicts the main crisis that, you know, which is, or the main narrative that the church had put out for a long time, or at least some people in the church, which was that the prophet only proposed to other men's wives when they were either not LDS or not worthy to take them to the temple. Well, that clearly is not the case because some of the men whose wives he's proposing to were apostles. And, um, and there's been some research done on a lot of this stuff. So polygamy and polyandry are, you know, in my opinion, probably the, the most challenging um, to deal with. But, you know, you can still deal with these things. And in the end, it's okay to not understand all the weirdness of the 19th century and some of the things that these guys did. Um, but you got to acknowledge the history, how difficult that may be. And, and, and in some instances, you have to apologize. You have to apologize and move on. And if you can do that, I think it's better for the church um, uh, to own up and in the end, do something that, that Latter-day Saints are often taught as little children, choose the right, let the consequences follow. And sadly, the church um, narrative has not always followed that trajectory. But I think that the church is trying to make a good faith effort now. And maybe for your listener in the UK, it's not going fast enough. Um, but I don't know how to deal with these kinds of things when these issues are very challenging. And uh, it's it, it's something that it, I know it baffles the church leaders. Yeah, it's I, I, I've often said I wouldn't want to be them because any decision they make is going to crack eggs and uh, they're going to lose people on one side or the other on both sides. And so um, I, I think probably it was really smart for them to go slowly, to go subtle, uh, to do it piecemeal and to be really low key about it. That was probably super smart of them to do. Uh, and, and, and for those of us who wish they had gone more boldly and quicker and faster and louder, I think a lot of the people that want that probably don't care about the church's overall health and well-being, because if they had moved too strong, too fast, too quickly, they probably would have seen some of the defections that the community of Christ faced in the late sixties and, and mid seventies when they made really big, bold changes and lost a third plus of their membership as a result of moving too quickly. Is that fair to say? It is, John. And um, I think, you know, I'm not here to defend anything or anyone. I, I hope your listeners understand that about me. And just, I'm a historian. I try to present things as I understand them. And I always try to be fair. And um, there are some things about some apostles that I've never, I, I like people, I, I always get asked, you know, which of the apostles do you like or dislike? And um and I'm just thrilled when I learn things about some of the apostles I don't like, you know, like, or I thought I didn't like, um, you know, Bruce McConkie is a great example, just sort of an intimidating guy, really kind of a bully in a way. Well, in recent years, I've come across some good stuff about another side of him, his great personality. And I, I was thrilled when I get that stuff because it, it shows that people are multidimensional. And um, I think that the important thing to think about, uh, about how the church operates especially more than ever in the 21st century, more than ever, is that it is a global church. There are 16 million Mormons, more than half reside outside of the United States. So whatever they do, they're trying to, they're thinking about people who are um, coming into the church from different parts of the world. And um, I, I can just tell you my bias, which is I get crazy. I'm like, what about me? Right. Or, or somebody who's um, uh, interested in, you know, something, uh, I remember in New York, I remember reading the, the lesson manual. I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. It's like written for a five-year-old. What about my needs, right? Uh, but they're looking at that new convert in Latin America. And, um, I, you know, didn't I didn't like it, but I certainly understand why they do it that way. And I think what they've realized is that the, the, um, the idea that you can't have a one-size-fits-all. They used to try that with various degrees of success. They've always had a basic kind of gospel principles manual for the new convert, but then they had the other manual for everybody else, whether you're in the church five years or 20 years, whether you had a high school diploma or a PhD. And I think now that they're, the church is starting to um, 
recognize there needs to be more, you know, diversity in terms of how this, this stuff is approached. And they're allowing the local leaders to have more flexibility in the lessons that they think their flock needs to hear. And I think that's great. That's to be applauded. But I would urge them to go to the next level and to talk about, um, how about this? Invite your, your, your uh, flock to, to submit questions about things they want to hear lessons on or, or discuss openly. Right. Whether it's race, whether it's LBGTQ or I mean, think about if you're an LDS mother and you've you've had a, a son who comes out as LBGTQ and um, that's on your mind. Right. You, you've been taught your entire life that the, the nuclear family is is the one that God prefers. And that's what binds people together in temples. And yet your son just comes out of the closet. And you're going to the church and you're hearing about something completely irrelevant. You don't care. You're just focused on something that really is a paramount concern to you. And I don't think the church listens enough to its people. They're, they're told, but they don't listen. And I think that's slowly changing. But if, if they're to stop the tide of people leaving, I don't think it's going to be about you know controversial historical issues in the past, although transparency is enormously important. I think it's about creating a space today in the 21st century where people can find meaning in going to church each week that helps them to address thorny issues in their day-to-day -day lives. I love it. Really quickly, I don't, I don't want to end this segment without having you just talk at a high level about the essays. And, and what, what one of the listeners asked was, um, are, you know, are there any essays that have caused more people problems? Are there some essays that have caused more people problems than others? I want to ask a different question. Are there some that are higher quality than others? Overall, there's a perception that they are, that they're either whitewashing or gaslighting. Can you give kind of an editorial judgment on the essays overall in terms of how uh, candid or not candid, manipulative or honest they are? And if you can talk about any just high level, unique or interesting um, components about the essays. And of course, I, I plan to interview several of the actual author, authors of these chapters in, in your book to drill down in more detail. But, but is there anything high level you can say about the essays individually uh, for our listeners? Yeah, so... Um... So this is an interesting uh, collection of essays about why they chose what they chose and perhaps what they left out. And um, there are a couple of puff pieces in here. And, you know, there's no question they knew that going into this the race and the priesthood and especially polygamy would be the most challenging. There's no doubt about it. The Book of Abraham would be huge, too. And um, and then you get into DNA in the Book of Mormon. Those are probably the most controversial of all the essays and, but, but you do get some puff pieces like are Mormons Christians? I mean, <laughs> I, I'm going to give you my buy. I, I hate hearing that stuff. Yes. They're Christians move on. Right. I mean, they may not embrace the creeds of various Protestant sects, but that's, you know, that's just, it's ridiculous. And so, um, and so the person that wrote this um, essay in the volume, my volume is a guy named uh, Craig Blom Blomberg. He's a distinguished professor of New Testament um, at Denver University Seminary, which is just up the road from where I live. And um, he had been working with Latter-day Saints before. We had uh, another person who was slated to, to write the essay, a guy named Stephen Webb, a Catholic theologian who, who's done some interfaith work with Latter-day Saints and Catholics and wrote a nice book, by the way, on Catholics and Mormons. Uh, but anyway, he died, unfortunately, uh, midway through this process. So he moved to Craig uh, Blomberg and Craig was gracious enough to step in and help out. And one of the things that I said to him was, you know, uh, put this in a comparative framework about how Mormons address this idea of Christianity and why some people have said that Mormons aren't Christians when clearly they are, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I mean, it's always baffled me to think that Mormons aren't Christian when it's just everywhere in their literature and on their signposts. Anyway, so that's what he did. Um, there were, uh, so, so the essays on polygamy were, there's no doubt they were, they were a challenge. And um, 
polyandry, in my opinion, I know some other people may disagree, but polyandry has got to be the most challenging thing, I think, for a lot of people in terms of their faith crisis. The Book of Abraham is probably, it's it's controversial among in, in scholarly circles, and that certainly played out on a national or at least a public scale with some of the folks who produced the Book of Abraham uh, volume on the Joseph Smith papers. There was a big brouhaha about that, about who they chose to edit and who they didn't choose. And so there's a long um, history with the book of Abraham. But I think most people in the church who were damaged by some of these essays dealt with polygamy. And I know one of the issues that they dealt with was describing one of Joseph Smith's wives. You know, I think what the language says, she was almost 15 or something like that. A few months shy of her, of her 15th birthday, which means she was 14, but they didn't want to say 14. Exactly. So they said a few months shy of her 15th birthday. That, uh, that was Brian Hales's. Uh, yeah, yeah. John. And that's, that's just not, I mean, um, I love you, Brian, but if you were in my class, my senior seminar class, I would have circled that and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> 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 that's not good writing. <laughs> and in fairness, maybe, okay, sorry, Brian, if you, if you, if those weren't your words, maybe it was a committee. Um, but anyway, there's definitely some, they're pulling some punches here and that's definitely a prime example. She's a few months shy of her 15th birthday. Nobody talks like that. She's 14, right? And the idea would be that um, the critics would say, of course, that uh, um, Joseph Smith is is engaging in uh, what's the right word here? Um, I hate to use the word pedophilia, but he's going after a, a person not of consent. And then, of course, the apologetic response is that's what they did in those days. They married young, and there's a big literature on this, and. I, I don't like things. That's what they did in those days, because that's simply not the case. If you break it down, um, certainly in some communities, rural communities, they married young. There's no doubt about it. Um, but you have to look at this region by region. And if you just take New England, for example, uh, Puritan girls were not marrying at the age of 14. And I realize they're not talking about, you know, Puritan New England here. But to suggest that that's what they did in those days, they married young and therefore the prophet was just doing an accepted practice. That, that's problematic. Um, in Puritan New England, for example, um, the women were uh, uh, in their early 20s, uh, 19, 20, 21 when they married. And one of the reasons is, is because their suitors had to own property. And there's no way you're going to get married at 17 and you had, you know, acreage for your farm um, in order to marry. And so they did marry a little bit later in, say, Puritan New England. And you'll find that it varies from region to region as you explore various parts of the United States in the 19th century. So uh, the real question would be, what was the, the mean age at which young women married um, in, say, Nauvoo or Kirtland? That would be far more interesting than just saying they all married that young, because that, that's just not true. Um, and there's a literature on this, too. There's a scholarly literature. So that was, that was really problematic. How do you uh, explain this? And to be honest and to be fair, I think that um, uh, this essay acknowledges some tough stuff that needed to be acknowledged. And um, something that I haven't done yet would be to look at this essay and then to compare it to what you see in the Saints volume. And admittedly, I'm going to confess something. I haven't had the time to read the Saints volumes yet. They're on my list. I'm going to read them. And my friends have been pushing me to read them. But it'd be interesting to compare the 13 essays and to see how they work their way into the Saints narrative and how the church historians have dealt with that. Um, so the polygamy essays are definitely uh, problematic. Um, the race and priesthood essay. When you say problematic, do you mean problematic in terms of their honesty or problematic in terms of people, you know, losing their faith? Because I want to understand both. I want to understand yeah. what grade they get for candor and honesty versus gaslighting, whitewashing, manipulation. And then if they've had a some type of effect on people. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um uh, so they do a good job. They they, they acknowledge polyandry, and I, 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 let me let me just walk through this uh, just real quick. This is really an important point. I think is the church has struggled with polygamy for a long time. I think most of your listeners will know this, and um, the church has always taught or frequently taught its lesson manuals that less than three percent of the churches practice polygamy, and they're getting this from a confessional that the church president Joseph F. Smith makes at the Reed Smoot Senate hearings in the early 20th century. And that becomes sort of the main, you know, thought that uh, less than 3% practice it. And there is a motive or a reason why Joseph F. Smith said that. 
And maybe he was misinformed. I don't, I don't know. So I'm not going to say that he was lying. I, I just don't know. But he certainly had a motive to keep the numbers low because they're having this knockdown, drag out fight whether they should seat the Senator Smoot. And the, the hang up was polygamy. This guy's a polygamist. And um, the Quorum of the Twelve, they had been split over polygamy. And so President Smith had every motive to, to say, hey, look, this doesn't happen in the church that often or that much. And whether I don't think, I, I don't know. I'm not going to say that he was fibbing or misleading. I, I just don't know. But certainly that was a problem when he said that. And for whatever reason, church curriculum writers through the years have latched onto that statement as if it's the gold standard. And we've had scholarship on polygamy since the 1960s that has really addressed that. That polygamy was far more expansive and pervasive than President Smith had let on during that uh, Smoot hearing. And, um, and so these essays do talk about they don't quote this 3% nonsense. That's been just debunked and demolished for a long time. Um, some church uh, historians have written some great books on polygamy and they've gone through the demographics of it and it's really fascinating literature. So that comes out that it was, it was more expansive than what the church manuals had said. I think that's huge. Also the polyandry thing that comes out and church historians are not church historians, but historians who, who follow this stuff um, it's not about polyandry for a long time. And that was the third rail. Nobody wanted to talk about it in the church. It was, they didn't have an answer for it. I mean, how do you describe this? And when you push somebody into the corner, they would say, well, yeah, the prophet, he only proposed to other men's wives who couldn't take him to the temple or who weren't members of the church. And that's, we talked about that a minute ago. Well, that's not sustainable when you, when you start lifting under the rocks and you, you see some of the facts. So, um, when Richard Bushman's book came out in 2005, this had been billed as the book on the prophet Joseph Smith. And it was supposed to be a, uh, a counter narrative to Fawn Brody's book that you referenced, John, that came out in 1945. I mean, Fawn Brody's book, it cannot be understated how influential this book was. Less so in the church and more so outside of the church. When people wanted to know about the Mormon prophet Joseph Smith, they went to Fawn Brody's book. And um, anyway... I don't know if it had a ripple effect in the church. Um, certainly people read it, but in terms of how it impacted scholarship, um, uh, you know, it was known to be an anti-Mormon book from the get-go. So nobody was ever promoting it in Orthodox circles. And um, in my Black and Mormon book that I'm working on now, I do talk about Fawn Brody's influence. She, she's the first person who, who conjures up this Missouri thesis that the priesthood ban began in the 1830s in Missouri to appease the local Missouri government to suggest that Mormons are not the abolitionists that you think we are. So she talks about that, and it has this incredible impact on um, LDS intellectuals, um, Darius Gray, my friend Darius Gray, Hubie Brown, first presidency counselor. So it, it does have impact, but it's not an orthodox book. And um, even today, it's still being sold on Amazon, which is extraordinary. Anyway, um, but Richard Bushman's book is supposed to supplant that book as the go-to book, not just for Latter-day Saints, but for people outside of the faith. And I've heard Bushman say this, that his book hasn't had the sales that he thought it would have, that it hasn't really supplanted uh, Brody. It's merely just taking its place alongside of Brody, which is still an important thing. But anyway, for our purposes, um, when it came out in 2005, um, I thought, how does he deal with polyandry? This is really, it, this, is, this is the elephant in the room. And I, I love Bushman's work. I love that book, but he, it's not one of the stronger parts of the book. He didn't understand polyandry in 2005. And pretty much what he said was, um, I think he, as I recall, he had maybe a paragraph. I need to double check this, but he had a paragraph where he talks about polyandry. He talks about polygamy or plural marriage. So let's be clear. He does talk about plural marriage quite a bit, but it's the polyandry part. Joseph Smith proposing to other men's wives, including those of whom were in the church leadership. How does, how does this distinguished Columbia University historian deal with this? And um, so when it came out in 2005, I looked and he basically said, we don't understand it. And I was like, ah, Professor Bushman, it's your job as a scholar to help us understand it. And he just didn't want to deal with it. And there were some issues on race in the book of Abraham he sort of punted too on. Um, those are, if I were to critique the book, those are two of the things that I would critique it on. But otherwise, it's a great book. Um, so, so this has been something that the church didn't want to, hasn't want to de uh, deal with, including it's one of its best scholars. And this is 2005, 15 years ago. So for um, one of the scholars, Jed Woodworth, who worked with him on this, they knew this was a problem. And 
I'm told this secondhand, and I'm sure Jed could confirm this or tell me I'm wrong, but I heard this from somebody that one of the reasons why he was employed at the church history department was to work on this very issue, to help work through this naughty issue of, of polyandry, to make it palatable to the church body. And uh, so there's no question that was the polyandry and polygamy were two, two important um, events here. And then also um, the third uh, essay written by Kathleen Flake, which deals with this, this narrative of um, 1890, which has always been problematic, which is Wolf, Wilford Woodruff issues the first manifesto in 1890. He's had a revelation. God tells him to lift the, the manifesto that the church is no longer to practice polygamy. Of course, the context is important. The U.S. government's um, going to arrest the polygamy, Mormon polygamy leaders. They're going to disenfranchise Utah territory voters. They're going to confiscate the temple property. I mean, the, the church is just on the, the cusp of being destroyed. And so President Woodruff has to do what he does. Well, the problem with the church narrative is, um, of course, he has a revelation and polygamy ends. Well, people who have studied this stuff, they know better. And one of the things that got Mike Quinn into trouble in the early 1980s is when he published a piece in, I think it was, was it Dialogue? Dialogue or, yeah. Anyway, um, in which he acknowledges these post-manifesto polygamous marriages, that there are two additional manifestos. One was in, I think, um, 1903 and 1904 or five, five, 19, anyway, somewhere in that area. And that they had to create two additional uh, manifestos because Mormons were still doing it. They were going to Mexico. When Mitt Romney um, was running for the presidency in 2012, they asked him about uh, marriage equality. And he said something that just made me want to pull my hair out, not just because I'm, a, I'm an advocate for marriage equality, but because he lied. And they asked him, they said, what do you think about marriage equality? And he looks in the camera and he says that... Um, marriage has always between, been between a, one man and a one woman. It's always been that way. And I thought, oh my gosh, Mitt Romney, you of all people should know better. His, his family, his grandfather went to Mexico and engaged in a polygamous marriage. And so for him to say that to a reporter who didn't know this backstory was completely disingenuous. And anyway, um, also in the early 20th century, my wife, um, interesting story that I think your listeners would want to hear. Her, uh, her grandfather was married in the Salt Lake Temple in 1905 to a second wife. And when I married her years ago, I found this out. I went, whoa. And I, I, I talked to, um, uh, so my mother-in-law, who's the daughter of the second wife, I said, wait a minute, Salt Lake? Yeah, Salt Lake. It wasn't Mexico. It was Salt Lake. And how did this happen? Was he active in the church? And she said, yes. My mother, so my wife's grandmother, and her, they, they were active well into the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And um, she, grandpa went to church with his two wives in Provo until they all died in the 60s. One of the wives died in the early 70s. I said, wait a minute. How does, what does this look like? This guy is going to the Utah Mormon church in Provo, Utah in the 1960s with his, his two wives. And she said, his name is Heber Farr. And she said that far ice cream, she said, um, uh, she said the bishop had an arrangement that he was called as a, by an apostle who was obviously pro polygamy in 1905. He called brother far in 1905 to take a second wife in the Salt temple. Don't tell anybody about it. And um, not even other apostles. That's how difficult this issue was. And so Heber far married a second wife in the Salt Lake temple and he had a special arrangement with the bishop that the brother allowed him to stay married to his two wives well into the 1960s. And the bishop of the Provo Ward told the flock, when Farr wasn't around, obviously, he said, Brother Farr is a good man. Don't make fun of his family. Don't ridicule him. Don't call him to repentance. The brother and know about this, and they've approved. And he had a temple recommend, and he served in church callings. He was a faithful Latter-day Saint. And anyway, um, so... Back to the, the uh, polygamy essay, that for um, plural marriage and families in early Utah to acknowledge that this stuff was still going on after 1890, I mean, this was a dramatic moment where Latter-day Saints could see, you know, like, oh, my goodness, you know, Quinn was right. The stuff that he had written back in the early 80s that got him into trouble at BYU, he was absolutely right that this stuff was going on. 
And so these are all admissions that the church authorities are worried about because they've been saying all along it ends in 1890. When now they're saying in this essay, that's just simply not the case. And you can, I, we can talk more and more about a lot of these essays. You'll, you'll find that um, a lot. But anyway, and you can go into details with some of the authors that you have on, John. But uh, polygamy, I think, in, um, is, is the biggest one. And let me, and there's the race and the priesthood essay that we'll get into more detail. So I probably won't say about that much about that now. But those are, I think polygamy is the, the one they worried about the most, at least among the general church body. And and what do you what do you make of you know critics, post-Mormons, ex-Mormons, even liberal Mormons that say the essays were a, they were gaslighting, they were whitewashing, they were, you know, a real huge disappointment. Do you do you do you do you even want to sort of make some sort of assessment, kind of an overall grade of how candid, you know, how much did the church really come clean? How much did they sort of gaslight and whitewash and kind of mislead people? Can you even speak to that or would you rather not? Well, I don't like to use the word gaslight, but um, I, I think really my job as a historian is to help people understand. Again, you don't have to agree with it. I mean, I'll tell you a problem that I have in just a second with one of the essays personally. Um, but again, they, these are done by committee. And remember what I said earlier about the one apostle who talked to my friend, we have gone about as far as we can go. In other words, we've been as transparent as we can without affecting people's testimony. And even then we've probably gone too far. So that's that's what's on their minds when they're putting these out. And um, the <laughs> I'm just going to be flippant for a moment, but some of these essays, I mean, you know, if I were to grade them <laughs> in terms of clarity, thesis, organization, they wouldn't hold up very well. And they're not just me personally, but just people who teach writing for a living. And the reason why they wouldn't hold up very well is because the language obfuscates and is muddied a bit. And I know a lot of these people who wrote these essays as scholars, and I know they're fine scholars, they're fine writers. And so clearly a lot of this stuff got, got changed as it went higher up the chain. And um, let me give you an example of what I mean. I don't like to use the word gaslight, uh, but it just kind of reminds me of um, Dallin Oaks's thing on Black Lives Matter a minute ago. You know, it's, it's generated a few days ago. Oaks gave a, a an address at BYU, I think, and he also spoke in general conference. And he mentioned Black Lives Matter. And then he talked about, you know, violence. Like, so he said one thing positive about Black Lives Matter, and then he sort of equates it with violence, which is completely not true. Black Lives Matter advocates, myself included, we're not throwing bricks through buildings. And um, anyway, so that was unfortunate. Trying to throw give a piece of meat, if you will, to both sides. And I, I just don't like that. Um, it's rattling that fence. And that's what they tried to do. And that's what they tried to do with the race and the priesthood essay. And, um, and the story that, it, that, um, that I know from some of my friends who worked on this essay and who commented on the essay is they wanted it to be very, very clear that, ra that the priesthood ban was born out of the racist milieu of Brigham Young's day. That is, God had nothing to do with it. So quit saying that, oh, just as some people had the priesthood in Old Testament times, so it was with blacks. That's complete nonsense. Because if you if you give this scriptural interpretation, like some of the authorities did back in the day, Joseph Fielding Smith, for example, then really you're imputing the ban to God. And, um, and so there was this push among the scholars and among some of the general authorities to say that it, it was it was the ban began because of the the 19th century and, and Brigham Young and Joseph Smith ordained black men to the priesthood. And then all of a sudden that's no longer the case, or at least people around Joseph Smith did. And that's no longer the case. And um, it's not really radical to think that jo Brigham Young was a racist, right? This is slave holding America. My goodness. But yet they wrote it in such a way that you could read into what I just said, racism from the 19th century or the idea that God is still responsible for it. It's really, really poor writing. And just as a simple thought experiment, my brother, who um, has three or four graduate degrees, including a doctorate degree, is a pretty educated guy, very Orthodox Latter-day Saint. He's in a state presidency, I think. And um, I, we were talking and I said, yeah, the church is, this document is, it talks about the racism. It, it, the ban is because of the racism in Brigham Young's day. My brother's like, I didn't read that. 
And I, I said, go back and read it. And he did. And he came back to me and he said, I don't see that at all, Matt. And, and then I have to walk him through it. And admittedly, I have, I have some background context to this because I talked to the people who produced it and commented on it. So I know what they were trying to intend. And once I walk my brother through it, oh, okay, I can see that now. And of course, my brother's a smart guy. He's a good reader. The fact that, that his older brother's having to walk him through it is problematic, right? Because the writing is not clear. And that was done by design. Yeah, there's a comment. There's a comment um, from a listener, and I'm not asking you to endorse this, but they say, um, from from the standpoint of this listener, the essays are psychologically misleading. Just take the first vision essay; it repeats, "quote the accounts tell a consistent story." End quote. Lo and behold, people repeat this phrase. He's saying that this this uh, commenter is saying low level brainwashing. I know again, you don't like that term. But, but, uh, but one of the criticisms I've heard of the essays are, frankly, a lot of the criticisms I felt reading Rough Stone Rolling with Richard Bushman. They're contextualized in such a way to where it's almost, it, it reminds me of the, the scene from, from the early Star Wars movie, These Are Not the Droids You're Looking For, and he hand waves, and, and the guy all of a sudden says, oh, there must not be a problem here. Like, they're written in a way to make someone absorb the information, but never quite realize the severity or the significance of the problems they're dealing with. Is that, do, do, you, do you hear that at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me give you you uh, a comparison, maybe. Um, there was a Harvard scholar named Samuel Elliott Morrison. He died in 1976. He was this two-time Pulitzer Prize winning historian at Harvard. And um, he's famous for writing books on Christopher Columbus, among other things. And of course, when he wrote in the mid 20th century, there's a lot of hagiography. Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered this, discovered that, and he's wonderful. Well, Columbus obviously is a lightning rod today for our indigenous brothers and sisters, as he should be, and um, including my own community. And if you look back at Samuel Elliott Morrison's work on Columbus in the 40s, 1940s, 30s and 40s, is that he acknowledges uh, some of the problematic stuff with Columbus and just moves on, right? He acknowledges it like a couple of sentences that he did some horrible things to the natives, cut off their arms and dismembered them and just moves on. And so that's that's his way of saying, hey, I dealt with it. And I think sometimes you, I, I dealt with it without trying to understand what it all meant and the impact that it had. And I think you get that in the church sometimes where people in two sentences, I acknowledged it and I move on. And I don't, I, I, I really admire Richard Bushman. Um, but in Rough Stone Rolling, that, you, you get a little bit of that too. I acknowledged it. So my critics can't say I didn't, I didn't talk about or mention polyandry, but then it doesn't make any attempt to, to, to engage with it. And I think that we have to, to ask ourselves, uh, what does this mean as writers? And I know I'm doing a book on Blacks and Mormons now, and there is so much to this story. It's just absolutely extraordinary. And um, as I write about all of this stuff, uh, just take, for example, patriarchal blessings. What does it mean to be a Black person in the LDS church and to go to your patriarch where you're supposed to declare lineage? What does that look like for a Black Latter-day Saint? Is he going to be told that he's from the seed of Cain? Yeah, that happened. Is he going to be told that he is to enjoy all the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which, which of course mean priesthood and temple blessings? That happened. And then lastly, let's not give him a lineage at all, because you know we can't tell him Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those are priests and temple blessings, and black people can't have that. Nor can we tell them they're of the curse of Cain, it'll hurt their feelings. And so um, what does all this mean? Well, as I write in my book, it means the church has adopted this, this, this terribly challenging racial theology that has boxed them in a corner. They don't know what to do with lineage with black people. They absolutely don't know what to do. They meet as apostles in 1958. They meet in 1970. They meet in 1973. And they realize the patriarchs are declaring lineage all over the place throughout the church, Brazil, South Africa. And, um, and it's this terrible burden they've created for themselves. <clears throat> and they have to sort of work their way through it. And the truth is they never do. The revelation comes in 78 and they still have people told, including somebody on your podcast, John, from years ago, a young uh, biracial black man who was told in the late 80s that he was from the seed of Cain, the lineage of Cain. 
So anyway, this is still this racial residue. And I think that as scholars, we have to ask ourselves, what does all this mean? Just did a book on Ezra Taft Benson, as you know, and we, you and I had a lovely uh, chat over a long time <laughs> with Benson. And I had to ask myself, all right, Benson's got all these conspiracy theories, but what does it all mean? Who influenced him? And how did he develop these views? He didn't always start out this way. And more importantly, how does Benson continue to affect the church today? Those are the overarching questions that, you know, as a scholar, I try to answer. And, and truthfully, with LDS scholars, there are some scholars who, who come out of, they take a leap forward and they try to address these challenging issues. Mike Quinn's a great example. He's acknowledging um, problematic issues in Mormon history long before a lot of scholars are today. And by the way, when he was writing about these things in the late 70s, early 80s, um, Mike was a believing, practicing Latter-day Saint. He worked at BYU, for goodness sakes. And so he was just, he felt that his Hippocratic oath was to tell the truth and to be sensitive and to be sort of as balanced as he could be, but also to not whitewash the past. And um, unfortunately, you know, Elder Benson and Elder Packer um, tried to pull Quinn and other historians in a different direction to only write things that are faith promoting. And we're still stug struggling with that um, legacy today. Yeah, that's something that I, I want to, I want it to be covered at some point, all the people that have been excommunicated for telling the truth. Fawn Brody to Jeremy Runnels to Bill Reel, you know, to Kate Kelly to me to others. That's a, that's a, I don't know if that shows up anywhere in this book, but a lot of people were sacrificed along the way before the church was willing to come clean. And they were excommunicated for talking about things that the church publishes in, in, in their essays. And that's, that's unjust. Um, yeah. But, but uh, okay. So overall, I think what I hear you saying is the church went as far as they could go. They did some good things, but they also, you know, did some, uh, did some contextualizing that is not really good writing and that leaves a lot of ambiguity. I think, um, I think the, I want to be clear. I think the essays, this is all I want to say about this. Cause I know you're going to interview the rest of the, or a number of the other um, authors, but you know, the essays are like the gospel topics essays are like anything else, John, that some of them are better than others, to be honest. And um, some of them, reveal more or knowledge more and some don't and I, I don't want to go into details with each of the essays but but i they there are varying quality is what i'm trying to say and i think that um it bears repeating that um some of the essays you know think about what they didn't decide to do lbgtq issues which is still a problematic issue today they didn't want to do anything with sexuality which i think is unfortunate and um, they didn't want to do anything with the quasi-Masonic elements of the temple ceremony, which I think is also unfortunate, because those are probably not as you know sticky as uh, blacks, a race, and polygamy. But nonetheless, they're important, and I think they they should have been dealt with. There are some other essays that that were not dealt with. The historicity of the Book of Mormon wasn't dealt with, and um, I don't know why they weren't dealt with in terms of you know my contacts didn't call me up and say, this is why we chose not to do these. I can only surmise that they just didn't have a plausible narrative and they were just too tough and too challenging. And this isn't to say that that this won't change and evolve. And theology is an interesting word. You know, it's, I guess, Aquinas, God's man's words about God, right? And we Mormons don't like to think of themselves as theologians because of this revelatory element with the prophet. But that's, I, I think that's really not a good way to put it. Um, God can still reveal to you um, a theology. And that's why in the church that church leaders typically not use the word theology. Um, but a lot of this is sort of this ongoing theology about how to make sense of this so that it's palatable to people who are having faith uh, issues. And, you know, I, I'm certain if they already have it, maybe they have, and I'm speaking out of turn here, but um I don't think that they've dealt with uh, sexuality, at least in terms of a scholarly analysis like they have here. And if I'm wrong, I'll be corrected. But if they haven't yet, they, they certainly will, because LBGTQ is huge. And it's probably one of the biggest issues of this generation that you've got Latter-day Saints um, who are growing up and they're adopting the attitudes around them. 
in terms of their acceptance and their tolerance of uh, LBGTQ issues. And they don't share their parents and grandparents' prejudices towards um, our gay brothers and sisters. And so it'll, it'll change one day. It'll change one day because today's um, Latter-day Saint youth who have these more tolerant views on LBGTQ issues, they're going to be tomorrow's leaders if they can stay in the church. And it take, it's a generational thing that, that we bring our own generational values to the table. And you see that with the race issue, right? You know, you, you get people in the 1970s into the 80s who just don't think that, you know, they don't agree with the church's views on race and black people. And a lot do. That's still part of the problem. But you start to see them adopting more progressive views. And you see that with LBGTQ issues. And that, that alone, that's frightening for the church leaders because they don't know how to deal with that. They, um, they've worked into this heteronormative theology. Um, and in order for them to embrace marriage equality, they have to redo, really, the underpinnings of the temple endowment ceremony of what Latter-day Saints teach about families, eternal families. And if you allow our gay brothers and sisters into that um, narrative, then it, it requires a lot of creative energy to change the theology. Kimberly Anderson um, is is basically saying that uh, Taylor Petrie and Greg Prince have have speculated as to why they they haven't written about LGBTQ stuff, and that's be and, and and that's because it you know according to Kimberly it strikes at the very heart of the plan of salvation that right. you know and, and this Kimberly also is always great to remind us and I try to remember this as well because I care deeply about this topic gender identity is separate from sexuality right. and so. If, if according to the church, gender is eternal, if our spirits have an assigned gender, and if we get the right body that matches the right gender from our gender spirit to our gendered body, then gender has to continue in the afterlife. And that gets to the proclamation of the family and marriage of, of men and women. And, and, and I guess Kimberly is reminding us that maybe one of the reasons they haven't talked about or written about sexuality or gender is that once you start going there, you start striking at the core of the plan of salvation. And Joseph didn't leave us any revelation for for gender questions or um, you know sexuality, you know non non heteronormative sexuality. And so that's that's a problem. Uh, how do you add? You would read. You would need real prophets, seers, and revelators to add on what Joseph, you know, prophesied about and revealed. And you know for couple hundred years, the brethren have really not wanted to add to the revelations Joseph received, for better or for worse. And so we're stuck with a lot of silence on gender issues and matters of sexuality because you don't want to unwind the plan of salvation, but you don't have anything else on this. Like the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, completely silent on gender and sexuality pr pretty much, right? And so what do you do? <laughs> Well, it's, you know, but here's, a, I agree. Amen to all of that. Sexuality is, and, and gender is, it's just problematic uh, for the church. And because it does require a fundamental reorientation in Mormon theology, it does strike at the heart of the plan of salvation, which is the nexus of all of this. And, um, but there is a silver lining a little bit, at least I see it as a silver lining. So with the LBGTQ policy, that had targeted the children of couples, right? Disenfranchising them from the church, from missions, from temple attendance, just based on the, the choices of their, their mother or their father. I mean, and then of course, President Nelson um, saying just a few months after the whole story broke and it went viral, that it was a revelation, digging his heels in. And when, when he said that in January of, what was it, 2017, I think, 2018? January 2018, I think, when he said that at BYU Hawaii, it was a revelation that we were all privileged to see. I thought, oh my goodness, I pulled my hair out thinking that once, you know, it's elevated to revelatory status, it then becomes canonical almost, at least quasi-canonical. And that's, that's they're digging their heels in that, you know, this is a problematic issue. And um, the apostles, some of the apostles didn't even know about this until it broke. So to suggest it was a revelation they were all privileged to witness was deeply problematic. And um, I'm told by a source that half the 12 supported it and half the other 12 didn't. Um, anyway, but the silver lining is, of course, that President Nelson reversed it a little while later 
and change the policy. And that's, that's, you know, whatever, whatever we as, as humans and cynics and critics want to say about it, at the end of the day, did the right thing. You know, the church created a policy. It wasn't, well, the church created a policy and they dug down on this policy. They recognized it was harmful and they changed course. And that, I, I don't know of any instances where that's happened, where a church leader has elevated something to revelatory status. And by the same revelatory status, you know, I don't know, 13 months later, they change it. I mean, that's, that's really amazing. And it's to be applauded. And so I think it can happen. But, you know, oftentimes in church leadership, uh, Spencer Kimball said something interesting that I think is is worth um, re saying for your audience. Let me just read this if you don't mind, John. It's a little statement. This is in my next book. It comes from a private letter that um, that, that Spencer Kimball wrote to his son, Edward. It's from the private papers of Spencer Kimball that I've been privileged to see. And this is apropos for the priesthood revelation I'm now writing as we speak. Uh, this is 1963, Spencer Kimball, Apostle Kimball, to his son, Edward. Quote, revelations will probably never come unless they are desired. I think a few people receive revelations while lounging on the couch or while playing cards or while relaxing. I believe most revelations would come when a man is on the top of his toes, reaching as high as he can for something which he knows he needs, and then there bursts upon them the answer to his problems. And one of the instructive moments here is that you've got to seek the revelation in order to make the change. And the revelation in this part is not what the church thinks a revelation is. This is really, I don't know, this, this is always frustrating to me. You know, the revelation, no, just like Moses and the Ten Commandments. That's complete nonsense. That's not how Mormon revelation works. When you compare it to Moses and the Ten Commandments, that probably conjures up images of burning bushes and God's voice speaking to you. Um, that's not how Mormon revelation works. Um, th there's a working definition, you know, the still small voice or sudden strokes of influence, as Joseph Smith once said. And those are, I suppose, hopeful, right? If, if you think that God speaks to people that way. But really a working definition of Mormon revelation is, Hugh Brown said it perfectly. He said, what revelation is, is we, the apostles, we get together in a room, we hash things out. We debate things. We debate things some more. Then we pray about it. And then we tell the church president, hey, this is this is what we think we want to do. And the president then says, okay, that's the direction we're going to go in. That becomes a revelation. So what's often lost in this idea of revelation is this notion of debate and discussion. Debate. That's what Brown said. Debate. Those aren't my words. Debate and discussion followed by prayer, followed by the president saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. And that becomes the revelation. And um, so the revelation, of course, I'm sure that Nelson, when he rescinded this awful policy, um, I'm sure there was a lot of debate and discussion about it that it's harming the church. And they had evidence everywhere on the Internet. And people were writing letters to the first presidency and bishops apostatizing and leaving their flock or or ignoring the council, which might even be worse. Right. I know of a couple of instances where bishops just said, we're not going to follow that. I've got a good young man in my ward and his parents are gay and not, he had nothing to do with them. He's, he's 18 and I want him going on a mission. He's worthy. He says he believes. So you have, you have an open rebellion really is what that is. And um, they recognize that that this awful policy wasn't sustainable. And so at some point Nelson had marshaled the apostles together and they discussed it and, and he felt inspired that they had to change it. But revelations really, really um, adaptable. And the genius of Mormon theology is you can make things on the fly like that by claiming revelation. And so if they want to change issues of sexuality and gender, they definitely could, but they have to know how to change and they have to want to change. And so far, I haven't seen a lot of evidence, at least among the highest um, in the church leadership, that they do want to change. Let me say one last thing. I've talked to two general authorities over the last, oh, two years. And both of them have said to me that... Um, that marriage equality is something that they are advocates for, they're lobbying for, and they want to see change. And what's really interesting about these two general authorities promoting marriage equality is not just that they're probably in the minority, but that, as is always the case in life, they had, they've had personal experiences with um, gay Latter-day Saints, and they've seen personally their, their sorrow and their travail and their anguish. And that certainly help them to step out of the Mormon theological box and to see these people as humans, as people, 
and worth keeping in the church and worth trying to change the church to make them want to be in the church. In order to do that, you've got to create a message that would appeal to their lives. And if you show up at church all the time and you just continue to hear this heteronormative version of marriage, that doesn't speak to a gay couple that's trying to follow what God wants them to do. Uh, absolutely. Let me ask you uh, just two other quick questions that I come to think of really quickly. Are you aware of any essays that they started to write and they scrapped? In other words, they had planned to write it, but it was just too hot or too polarizing and they shelved or scrapped the essay. Are you aware of, of that? No, but I do know. No, I'm not. But I do know that they talked about um, sexuality and gender and they talked about um, the temple ceremony and the Masonic influence. They did talk about both of those essays, but those were just too hot and too live to deal with. So but, they considered writing essays about them, but decided explicitly decided not to talk about those. Yeah. From, the, and I'm the, sure to not talk about them. And, the, the, and again, it's, it's the, the masonry in the temple. And what was the second one? Sexuality and gender. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And there might've been others too, John, but I just know from okay. my contact that those two in particular. Are you aware of any plans to write more essays in the future or are they, as far as you know, they're done? No, as far as I understand, there, there are, they do want to deal with some of these issues, but again, I, I want your listeners to understand this is a process that they felt that in 2013 or when they started to, to do this um, around the, the Swedish rescue mission, that they felt like these are the issues that were on the Swedes' minds at the time. And um, these are the issues that they could probably put together a coherent narrative. And um, the other ones were just too difficult. But I, I do know, I've heard that um, over time, I know they, they've added stuff over time too. I want to be clear. So I need to go on the church website to see the new stuff they've added. But I do know that this is a sort of evolving thing. It wasn't meant to be a one and done. I don't know if they'll continue to call them the LDS Gospel Topics Essays. They might be called a different name going forward, but they fully intend to create a response um, for these challenging issues. And I'm sure there'll be others as we move along too that they feel the need to address. It's based on context, right? It's based on the, the idea that people need to read them because it's a problem. And they wouldn't be dealing with, um, say, sexuality and gender uh, if it wasn't for LBGTQ Latter-day Saints leaving the church. Yeah. All right. Well, I just want to make a huge plug for this book. Um, I want everyone that within the sound of my voice or who can see me to buy this book. So much of what we have, we owe to Signature Books. Signature Books is a legend. George Smith, uh, Ron Prittis, Gary Bergera, just those people, so much of the scholarship that we have in the 80s, 90s, and beyond is thanks to Signature Books. And this book, I'm just going to say, I just read, other than the introduction, I've read one essay that we're going to talk about in our next interview, which maybe today, maybe not. We're going to talk about that afterwards. The, the essay is called Whiteness Theology and the Evolution of Mormon Racial Teachings by none other than Matthew Harris. This is, I, I've been, you know, I've been following the Blacks and the Priesthood issue forever, I learned stuff in this essay that was just mind blowing. It's a phenomenal essay. And that's just one of the essays here. You all will love this book. So buy this book right now. The LDS Gospel Topic Series, A Scholarly Engagement, Matthew Harris and Newell Bringhurst. So many great essays. Let's support this history and this scholarship or it won't continue. If you are tired of People not getting the facts, people not getting the truth, support historians, support scholarly publications. Go buy this book right now on Amazon or wherever this book is sold. Where can they get this book, Matt? Well, Amazon, for one, I think that's probably the easiest way to get it. Just go on Amazon. So okay. I think you can order it directly through Signature, but Amazon. Oh, Benchmark Books, too. So Amazon and Benchmark Books are great. My friends at Benchmark Books... They have copies. They would, if you live in the Salt Lake area, arrange to go get a copy from them, and they, or they can mail you a copy too. They're very good at mailing things. And I'll make the same offer. If you buy a book, just like I I, I said at the Ezra Taft Benson book, I will take you out to dinner. I'll take you out to lunch. We'll have a get together once COVID ends, and and I will reward you 
in whatever way I can for your support of this scholarship. So Matt Harris, thank you so much for this amazing book. Travis Stratford, Hans Matson, Marlon Jensen, uh, you know, everyone who contributed to these essays. I just want to thank all of you, Greg Prince. Uh, and uh, what an amazing book. What an amazing gift to us. So thank you, Matt Harris. Any final things you want to say about this book? I don't think so. Well, one last thing. This is just supposed to be, or at least Null and I had intended it to be the start of a conversation about, about the gospel topics essays, about transparency. And, and I, I want to end on a positive note because I think it's worth, it really is, uh, so much negativity in the world with some of the crazy presidential politics we've been dealing with. So the positive note is the church is moving, however slow, perhaps, but they're moving in the right direction. Um, and it started with the Joseph Smith Papers project, the multi-volume project that they have been doing, still doing. Um, I think there's like 24 volumes total that's anticipated and there are, what, 22 volumes into it. So it's coming to a close. But anyway, this this new era of transparency wasn't just the Gospel Topics essays. It's the Joseph Smith Papers volume. And it's also allowing scholars access to collections that were previously shut off. And uh, we still have ways to go. There are collections that that folks like me want to see that can't see for a variety of reasons. But anyway, the church is moving towards transparency. And I think that's that's to be applauded because this is something that's really important for the health and growth of the church. Absolutely. And so I guess I should say kudos to the LDS church and all of those involved in putting these essays forward. Of course, you know, you've done a good job. If there's some who think you went too far and there's some who think you didn't go enough, clearly that's what the essays represent. And so thank you and congratulations to the Mormon church after decades and decades and decades, um, finally starting to come clean in a way that is meaningful and tangible. And I hope you Mormon church will just continue and we'll just have more and more truth and transparency and honesty in the future. Amen. <laughs> All right, Matt. So we're going to come back either today or at another date very soon and talk about the, uh, your, your comments on race in the priesthood essay and on uh, white supremacy and white theology. But Matt, you're a legend. You are a, a real treat to uh, all of us in Mormonism. You're a gift to the Mormon people. I can't thank you enough for this and for your other appearance on Mormon Stories and for your future appearances. We just, we bless you health. You know, we 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 pray for your health. We pray for your uh, safety. And we pray for much more scholarship from Matt Harris. <laughs> Thanks, John. I appreciate that. It's kind of you. <laughs> Enjoyed being with you today. All right. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll be right back with you to figure out what we're going to do about the next thing. But I'll close today just by thanking everyone who uh, joined us today. Again, the book is the Gospel, LDS Gospel Topic Series, A Scholarly Engagement. Matt Harris, Newell Bringhurst. Please buy it, support it, check it out. And um, we'll be interviewing Matt and others. Our plan is to interview other uh, authors of the chapters in this book who reviewed the various essays. So a deep dive into polygamy, a deep dive into maybe Book of Abraham, if we haven't already covered that enough. Maybe a deep dive uh, into, you know, the Book of Mormon translation. If I can get John Charles Duffy on Mormon Stories podcast, I'll be thrilled. You know, John Turner, if I can get Gary Bergera, George Smith, Neil Bringhurst to talk about plural marriage. Like, uh, I hope to get several of these authors on, and uh, it'll be a real treat for me if I do. But um, thanks for supporting Mormon Stories podcast. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. If, if you're a donor, you uh, keep us alive, so thank you. If you don't donate, less than one out of a thousand of my listeners actually donate. If only, you know, a thousand of you donated $10 a month, it would transform what we, the value that we can provide to you, uh, the Mormon people and the post-Mormon people. So please become a monthly donor, uh, 10 bucks a month, 25 bucks a month, hundred bucks a month, whatever you can afford. We'll be able to keep uh, the lights on. We'll be able to keep producing this podcast. We'll be able to keep doing things within Mormonism and Mormon culture to help advance the cause of truth and healing for active Mormons and for ex-Mormons and progressive Mormons and post-Mormons. We want to help everybody heal and grow. We want more transparency. We want uh, more healing and growth. We want a healthier experience in the church and a healthy, healthier experience out of the church. And we need your support to do that. So please support us. Uh, 
Give us a positive review on uh, the Apple uh, podcast app. Please give us a positive review on our Mormon Stories podcast Facebook page. We have haters that are always giving us down votes and they don't even listen to the podcast. Um, and please spread the word. Share this episode with as many people as possible on Reddit, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. The more you can spread the word, the more we can share the goodness. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for all our listeners who joined us live on Facebook and on YouTube. Your comments and suggestions really make things better. Um, so uh, thanks for everyone who joins us live. It's always such a pleasure. You guys take care. Love you guys. And we'll see you again very soon on Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, take care, everybody.